My name is Drew. I'm 46 years old. I was a Jehovah's Witness, and I am shunned. All right, Drew. So how'd you come to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the first place? Uh, I was born in. Um, my parents were uh, not born in. Um, I always assumed they were. I always assumed we all were, you know. <laughs> but they would, they were brought in. Um, I think my mom was 11. My dad was 13. Um, my dad, on his side, he was, uh, when he was 13 years old, he was in a horrific uh, accident. He got hit by a car. When he was riding his bike, he got ran over. Um, the lady didn't know what she hit, so she backed up, ran over him again. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And then, so for some reason, went forward one more time because she saw a bike and a kid under it. Went forward again three times, and he, um, his arm was completely almost detached. Like, it was, he was in the hospital for nine weeks. Um, he had a severe brain injury, which um, affects, still affects him to this day. And, um, yeah, he was in the hospital for nine weeks. He got, he was released the day of the Kennedy assassination. 1963 so yeah he was hospitalized for a while then i'm assuming that's when the jehovah's witnesses came knocking to my grandma's door you know because of the tragedy and all that and uh yeah so that's how that started on her side um grandma was in uh, my dad had three brothers or two brothers one did not was not a witness or or his father was not a witness either. They didn't want they didn't want anything to do with it. So just my dad and his younger brother and my grandmother. Um, so and then on my mom's side, um, my grandfather and my grandmother, they didn't get married, but they were um he got he, he got her pregnant nine times, but she had five miscarriages. Mm. So, yeah, but um, then she, they had um, my mom and my three uncles. And then after that, they split up. And my grandfather married my grandmother's uh, niece. So that complicated things a little more. Um, so... Um, so did you say your mom was like 11? She was 11, yeah. She lived... When my grandfather and grandmother split, um, she moved in with my grandmother. Mm. And my three uh, uncles, they, they stayed with uh, grandpa and his new wife. She had three kids also, three girls. And then they had three kids together. So this is really uh, not a family tree. It's like a family forest. It just like exploded. And... Um, yeah, gr grandma's niece was 20 years younger than my grandfather. Uh, and they stayed together till until he died in uh, 1984. Um, so oh. when my mom stayed with my grandmother. She, you know, she was a kid. She wasn't really into the witnessing. Going to Kingdom Hall and stuff, she would go and um, she went to my grandfather's house. I think they, they'd go on weekends and she'd go there on weekends and, um, you know, they'd go to meetings on Sundays. And she wasn't really into it until uh, she met my father, which was, um, that was 1971 they met. And um, they, uh, they went on a date. I think this was March of 71. They went on a date. My uncle and my mom's best friend were the chaperones. And um, five months later, they got married. My mom was 19, my dad was 21. And then, um, boom, nine months later, my, my firstborn, my sister, my older sister was born. Exactly nine months. I mean, she conceived on her wedding night. And the elders wanted to disfellowship her because they thought she got pregnant before they got married. Because it was exactly nine months from September. They got married September 11th. And then... She was married, or she she was born in June, June 9th, which was 40 weeks. So they wanted to dis disfellowship her, and she, I don't know how she proved it, but I guess she didn't get disfellowshipped, but um, anyway, 
I mean, uh, my goodness, what a what a ridiculous technicality to try to disfellowship yeah, somebody. Yeah, exactly. You know? It's like, really? Come on. Yeah. They're just it's nitpicking ridiculous. looking for things. Um, I do find it, you know, interesting as you're talking about just, I guess, the origin story of this in your family is, mm-hmm. you know, again, like so many others, you've got a lot of uh, drama, dysfunction or vulnerability or, you know, just mm-hmm. um, trauma, you know, different things that are happening to people, you know, when the Jehovah's Witnesses or the religion happens to come into their lives. And um, Yeah, yeah. I think um, my grandfather... I think he got witnessed to somehow. I don't really exactly know how, but that's how he ended up in. And then he brought his new wife in, and she's still a witness. Hmm. And um, every time I see her, she's like, it would be nice to see you at the hall. And it's been going on for like 30 years, like every time I see her. But she moved to Louisiana, so I don't worry about that anymore. <laughs> yeah, you meet in New York, you got a, you got a good buffer yeah, zone. There's a lot of uh, space between us, so. <laughs> yeah, I, this is, comments like that are so so ridiculous. It's like, yeah, it's like you're seeing me now, I'm... aren't you happy about that? Yeah, exactly. And it's just um, it's weird. Yeah, it is. Um, so, you know, with, with, with that history, you know, it, and you talked about like your, I guess your oldest uh, sister being born. So it, it, it trickles down to you. You're born in um, yep. how, how, what's the worldview that you had, you know, being raised in it, being this little Jehovah's witness. Uh, what was, how did it make you see the world around you? I was scared of everything, everything around me. I was scared. I was born in uh, 74, August of 74. Just under the radar for uh, stay alive till seventy five. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, we would have uh, just waltzed right into the new system. My parents, me, and my older sister would have been, you know, um, would have went through and been on the other side, happy and petting pandas. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't happen, obviously. And then um, 76, 78, and seventy eight, seventy eighty, or yeah, seventy eighty, seventy eight and eighty. Um, my parents blessed me with three more sisters. So, yeah, that was that was okay. But I wanted a brother, but I never got a brother. Yeah. So, so it was you and four girls? Me and four girls. I was second, so I guess that was okay. I mean, <laughs> considering. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and all our names start with A. My name's, full name's Andrew, of course. And... We had all A's, Amy, Andrew, Alicia, Allison, Adria, and everybody would always comment on that. Oh, all A's, isn't that wonderful? And you're the only boy. That's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> Thanks I mean, for that out. <laughs> yeah, it was rough. You know, my first, when I was younger, a lot younger, but we get along now. Um, but yeah, I'd be, uh, you know, I couldn't like, they'd pick on me and tease me and stuff. I couldn't retaliate or I'd get my ass beat by my dad. So and he was always relentless. He'd spank me hard and leave the room. And then like 10 minutes later, he'd come back crying, which was so awkward at times. Like he comes in and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you know, and I'm just like, yeah, okay, it's okay. But what do you say, you know? No, no, that's that's <laughs> just that's, so weird. That's uh, insult to injury because yeah, uh, it's just so abusive. Uh, the person... Yeah. Uh, acts out upon you and now you're left to comfort the abuser that's that's yeah. so it's so twisted yeah it is and yeah it was just always weird um yeah my wife my wife faced similar things so yeah understand yeah yeah no i was the one you know i should know better because i'm stronger than them and I don't think I was. I mean, if they ganged up on me, you know, I'd be in a lot of trouble. I was just a skinny guy. But uh, growing up, was uh, it was rough. Um, we didn't have money. Uh, my dad, because of his injury, he worked for his uncle, my uncle Brian, his, his brother, um, for a while. And then his uh, memory started fading because of his head injury. and. My, my uh, uncle fired him because of that. And that was like early 80s, I'd say. 
and he hasn't been able to work since. He's had a couple jobs here and there, but that they never, never lasted long because he just couldn't focus. He didn't have that. You know, he had, he could remember things from years ago, but the like remembering what he was supposed to do, like right there, it didn't just didn't register with him. And short term memory. Uh, yeah, short-term. yeah, short term memory. Yep. So, um, yeah, we pretty much had everything that the government would give us. Uh, food stamps and, you know, all that stuff. Um, my mom would babysit kids for some extra money, but, you know, it was never much. Um, That's just so, it's so, it's, I mean, first of all, uh, you know, I, I do know, um, yeah, look, being one of Jehovah's Witnesses makes you different in certain ways uh, anyway. But mm-hmm. when you add in the uh, economic difficulties, uh, that that adds another layer. It's really tough. I I understand, you know, when you, you can't afford or have the things that other people you, around you, maybe at school or whatever, have. Mm-hmm. That's tough. And, and I just, man, I feel for your dad because, you know, he just, that, the, the the wreck, I don't know what to call it, the the incident, the accident. Mm-hmm. Um just yeah. that's that's just so awful. And it, you know, it's, it's a, just a moment in time can impact you for so long. And this is terrible. I, I yeah, he to told me that. um not that long ago. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but no he told me um it was wasn't that long ago that that day he was supposed to be at football practice, but they canceled it. So if he was, yeah, if he was at football practice, that wouldn't happen. Wow. It, yeah. It's crazy how things happen like that. But yeah, that really changed his life. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a miracle he survived, you know. Yeah, you know, he was run over three times. Also, what the heck, lady? I know, exactly. You know, it was in the 60s, so those cars were not, weren't exactly light, you know. <laughs> so... Just, Even if they were, it doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Three it times. Not. Yeah. Stop the car, get out, and see what's yeah, going on. There was another kid with him, like on the side of the road. And, you know, she, I don't know what the hell she was thinking, but yeah, that's. So you grew up then, um, you know, having, I guess, to just survive really uh, financially. And that, yeah. that's t- that's tough in and of itself growing up as a kid. Yeah, for sure. And then um, I went to four different elementary schools, so that didn't help. Ooh. You know, um, kindergarten, I went kind of, um, I got held back my first year because um, when I was born, I was sick. I had a uh, I had pneumonia, and ear infections, and they didn't think I was going to make it, but. Um, I made it. Here I am. <laughs> but Superman. yeah, was, yeah, Superman <laughs> all the way. Um, but I, uh, yeah, first first year of school, I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to spell my name, so they held me back. And then after my f- second year of kindergarten, well, first and a half year, I went to one school, and then we moved, and I went to kindergarten and up to second grade, and then we moved again a third and fourth and half a fifth and then from fifth on we went and we ended up where we finally settled in from fifth till uh high school through high school but that was hard you know trying to get in and out trying to make friends and you know you're already weird and different and <laughs> especially in elementary school you know it's really it's really hard to uh make friends well you can make friends but then you leave and try to make new friends and they've already got their own thing going on. And, but yeah, I did yeah. have one, one friend. Um, my mom let me have one friend out, outside of school. He lived next door to us. So, cause she had to meet his parents and everything and, you know, grill them about whatever. I don't know what they talked about, but <laughs> it was, after that, it was okay for me to hang out with him outside and we'd, uh, Push each other around in shopping carts. 
and <laughs> stuff like that. You know, the old old school stuff, just running around, goofing around, and fun stuff. <laughs> I'm still friends with him to this day. Um, still keep in touch and everything. So that's my one friend from my childhood. That's that's um, really cool though that you you all are still friends to this day. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah, because so many of us, when we're shunned or whatever, we we lose our roots, we lose everything that mm-hmm. came uh, came before that. So it's really cool that you still have this one friend uh, that. Uh, yeah, from I met him, met him when I was six or seven, somewhere around there, and yeah, we're still we still keep in touch. I mean, it's hard, you know, with families and everything else, and being adults, <laughs> but it's it's good to keep in touch with everybody. Yeah, that's cool. So school then. Um, I guess was that in any way an escape from being one of Jehovah's Witnesses? I mean, did you did you enjoy um, school or or find some early on. there, or did you just feel kind of like a weird or an outcast? I mean, again, I also understand that it's not just the J Dub thing; it's also the the moving thing, which makes it hard. Yeah, right. Yeah, it was. Um... I liked it for, like, in an elementary school, it was okay. Um, I wasn't ashamed of being a Jehovah's Witness back then, um, except for I hated having to go out in the hallway when they had birthday cupcakes or stuff like that. Then, like, towards fourth and fifth grade, it was, um, I would stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I just, I'd, like, pretend to put my hand on my heart and lip the words just so people around me wouldn't think I was weird. (laughs) <laughs> like that yeah that was like the last school the last elementary school i went to but um yeah i, I, I liked school for like the first few years and then getting into middle school it was it was a little harder um but middle i did make the worst <laughs> it is but i made some good friends in middle school i guess i was lucky mom I don't know if I mentioned this. My dad faded. He just stopped believing. Um, early '80s, I think I was like six or seven. He just stopped believing. He didn't want to do it anymore. And my parents stayed together the whole time. So, so how did that of- change the dynamic of your house? Because he's supposed to be the spiritual head, right? Um, and I don't know. You know. Obviously, there's always been some emphasis on family study, not quite like it is today, where that's replaced a, a former meeting. But you know, right. um, I guess let's get to a little bit of of, of your family dynamic. Uh, what was it like? You know, what was your childhood like at home? Uh, especially, you know, I guess a little bit before and then after he faded. Mm. Before, um, you know, he he. Um, I don't know. I don't think he was an elder, but he was like a ministerial servant and he'd give talks and stuff. And yeah, he'd give talks a lot and he, he, you know, really good talks. And then just all of a sudden one day, he just didn't want to do it anymore. Um, you know, before, before he went, we were like all into it. Like, um, you know, we'd go out in service and, you know, meetings three times a week and we'd have, uh, like our, Bible studies at home and when he wasn't there my mom had to put a towel on her head or whatever it was I always laughed at that but um yeah was, even after he uh he stopped going my mom was like gung-ho she wanted us to keep going and she would do everything she could I mean it was hard with you know five kids so my grandmother would take us a couple of us sometimes or um Sometimes when she wasn't feeling good, she'd have, she had a couple friends at uh, the Kingdom Hall that would uh, take a couple of us and stuff like that. And then we'd go, we'd go out in service with different people. Just, I hated it. I never really liked going out in service because I just didn't like talking to people about this stuff. Then, especially you know, especially when I was getting up to like eight, nine years old, it wasn't that I didn't believe it. I did, but I just didn't understand why, like, everybody else around us, because they didn't believe, why are they going to die at Armageddon? You know, why, why, just because they don't know, you know, they don't know who Jehovah is, or, so why would they, you know, 
even the nicest people I've ever met that are not Jehovah's Witnesses, why do they have to die? You know? It's like because they had their chance. They did have their because, chance, yeah. Right, right. They had that they had that uh, watchtower in their uh screen door. They could have looked at it, <laughs> opened it up. They didn't have to slam the door in our faces. Right. So I guess yeah, that would uh definitely justify it. <laughs> yeah, they, they they had a one magazine or a track left in their door and they didn't immediately change their whole lives. Right. So therefore, yeah. uh, they have to be murdered by Jehovah. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Which is, uh, it was just sad. No, it is. It is. It's hard to wrap your mind around as a kid, too, that all these other people around you uh, are worthy of destruction. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, did you all, um, so you, you're, you said your mom was gung ho. So, did, did you all then go to all the meetings? I mean, were you all very regular giving talks and out in service every Saturday or whatever? Uh, yeah, when I was really young, we were um, maybe till I was like 10 years old, I'm guessing. We would go like every meeting, every Bible study, you know, at the person's house or whatever. And we looked forward to it, you know, was, especially going to the people's house. Uh, the one that we went to, they had, uh, their family had a boy my age, which um, we got along pretty good. But they, they ended up not, they ended up leaving too, years later. So, yeah, that was a good family. They, um, they helped my mom out a lot. And, um, yeah, those are fun times. But, um, how was it at home? Um, you know, like, I know you all were struggling financially, and I, I know we're talking about kind of like your experience within the family as one of Jehovah's Witnesses and what you were doing there. Did you all, did you have any good times? Did, did you and your sister oh, yeah. do anything fun? Did you play? Uh, did you all have, you know, play games or ever get to go on? And I know financially it may have been difficult to go on vacations I, I don't know the circumstances but no, we never did vacations camp or go to parks or do anything fun no the the, fun, the most fun thing we ever did was um drove two hours to my mom's friend's house like two hours away and that was pretty much all we did we went and visited relatives and my mom's friends and just road trips like that but nothing we never went anywhere i don't think we went to vermont that's where my mom's friend lived. It was right next door. On the map, it's right next door. <laughs> but uh, that's pretty much all. That's as far as we went. Didn't really go too far. But uh, yeah, me and my sisters, as we got older, we started getting along more. And I figured I have to live, live with them for at least 18 years. So um, might as well get along with them. <laughs> and then they started having friends over. And um you know they all had crushes on me and not to be uh not to brag or anything but you know they had crushes on me and that was like when i was an early teenager but um yeah something i wanted to go back to when i was in uh first grade no it was my second year of kindergarten um my mom was in uh, the hospital having my baby sister. And um, there was a, I guess a teenage neighbor came over with her brother and they, uh, they were babysitting us. I was five, I think my sister was seven, my oldest sister was seven, seven or eight. I think I was like five and a half. And um, we had this, uh, it was a cardboard box. I think it was like an old refrigerator box or something. We use it as a fort, and um, that teenage brother um, came, went in the box with me, and he molested me. That's like one of my earliest memories. Um, I've never said this out loud. Um, yeah, uh, we were in there for quite a while, um, and so much so that I, when I came out, I had to adjust my eyes because it was so dark in there. But um, after he did what he did, he, he told me that um, 
I better not tell tell anybody or he would hurt my family or whatever he said. Um, I don't, I don't remember, um, his name. I wouldn't say it anyway, but, um, yeah, I just, I was five, five and a half. I didn't know what's going on. I didn't know any better. So I just, okay. I you told me not to say anything. I won't. So I just, uh, pushed that aside and, um, moved on from there. I don't know if I actually moved on because, you know, everything that's happened to me, I, I've never said anything to anybody. So I'm kind of, uh, <sighs> well, I'm, I'm sorry that that happened. Heal, uh, this is why I'm here. I'm trying to heal from all this. Yeah. So it has to be said. I know I have to say things. Um, well, I, I, I'm so sorry that that happened. Uh, that's not, this is such a, like it's such a traumatic thing. It's something that a lot of people live with. You're not alone. Um, there's mm -hmm. so many people that have had these experiences and, um, I mean, you yeah, should come to this. realize this. I'm sure there's other people who will hear this and, you know, something happened in their life too. And mm. if, we, if we, we talk about this stuff more and, you know, see that we're not alone and there are so many other people that have gone through similar things, um, you know, start to heal from these things, you know, owning these traumas mm. that happen to us at times. And I'm just, uh, again, I'm just really sorry that that happened. Uh, he was really young too. He was um, 14, 15, maybe. So, who um, knows, you know, where that came from in his life. Right. Hindsight, um, you know, it's probably, it probably happened to him too. It's just uh, terrible, a terrible cycle. And um, yeah. Uh, and you have nothing to be ashamed of. You know, you didn't do anything. Something was done to you. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just really, really unfortunate that that, that had to happen in your life. Um, yeah. Because I know those things tend to stick with people. Um, but yeah, yeah, it definitely does. Owning it and it has it happened. Yeah. I mean, it, it has right. stuck with stuck with me you know i pushed it aside i didn't really think about it about anything really you know i just sure me what i realized is that i care about what other people think or other people's feelings before my own you know and i like i never really took care of any of my uh issues well drew that's normal um uh without getting into all of it here uh, mm -hmm. we were gaslit you know, being yeah. gaslit is, is a way to, to separate people from trusting themselves, from uh, their own thoughts and feelings, so that they have to look toward, you know, whoever's doing the gaslighting to feel okay. Right. Uh, most people that I coach are dealing with issues of codependency because we were raised in a narcissistic cult environment. And so, you know, yep. most of us have been raised to manage everybody else's emotions keep everybody else happy and kind of lose ourselves in, in that process. Yeah. And I mean, you were so young, you didn't even, I mean, you didn't even know what was happening, you know? Right. Um, no, I really didn't. You know, there's no shame in, in, in any of that. Um, mm. Just, um, but yeah, the, the way those things happen, it's, it's very, I mean, it's abusive beyond the uh, the physical aspects of it. It's just abuse. You know, you tell anybody, "I'm going to hurt your family" or whatever. You know, yeah, honestly, you believe them. Yeah, honestly, it's kind of like if you don't believe what we believe anymore, keep your mouth shut. Don't tell anybody. If you mm -hmm. do, we're going to take your family. You know. Yeah. Like yeah. Pretty much. Does. You know, there's just a lot of weaponizing of of things in those instances. It's just terrible. Um, yeah, and especially for a little kid to carry that around, uh, you deserve mm -hmm. better than that. Especially having the the JW mentality, you know. <laughs> uh, it's well. Did you? So there's a question. You know, the JW mentality. Then did you feel like you were wrong? You were bad. Yeah. You were somehow defective. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Jehovah's gonna be mad at me. Sure. No. That was... Something that you didn't do right that yeah. was done to you it was so much bigger than me what was i supposed to do you know i was just in, in that situation i right just froze <laughs> pretty much 
Yeah, we don't have control over our fight or flight or freeze or fawn, whatever reflex, right? We don't we don't pick which one that we experience in the moment or which right. one yeah. that, you know, some people are just naturally fighters. Some are more prone to freeze, whatever. We don't pick that. It's just the way we're wired or whatever the case may be. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you were just – most people freeze in those situations because – it's shocking and they don't they it was unexpected so you can't yeah. prepare for that right exactly <clears throat> um, where am I? um sorry i'm just still looking oh that's okay so that happened um did you so i i'm guessing then you, you just didn't tell anybody no Ever. No, I didn't you, tell anybody. It's the first time you said it. I didn't know if you, you know, back then told your mom or anybody, but no. Yeah. Okay. No, I just, that was that. Nothing. Never said it. Spoke of it. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was rough. Um, <laughs> well, where do you go from there? So, uh, I'll just say, you know, so you were a young kid then. Um, you're in this witness family. Uh, do you, you know, at some point you're going to get baptized, right? So, like, uh, you, you're you going down this path with your mom being this gung-ho witness and everything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you and your sisters are all going to meetings and out in service and all this stuff kind of swept up in this life so how did things progress as you got toward you know like being a teenager um well they weren't really um gung-ho about us getting baptized oh really because well some of the elders were but my mom and dad i guess my dad um wanted us to wait till we were older you know to see if you know this is what we really wanted so my, in a way, my dad was my saving grace in that aspect. So um, none of us kids were ever baptized, which is, um, that doesn't mean we're still not talked to by anybody. Um, but yeah, we never, uh, never pursued that. I know when I was a teenager, once I got to like 13, 14, I was hanging out with the, you know, the wrong crowd at school and kind of like being rebellious and hanging out. I hung out with these um, group of like four kids. They were troublemakers and I just wanted to uh, fit in. So um, they would uh, we'd go to um, these old buildings in town where we lived. Um, we would break into those buildings and just mess around and vandalize stuff and uh did that like for a few weeks um and then uh after after a while the um cops came to school and uh picked all of us up brought us down to the station and we got arrested for all the vandalism and everything um the only reason we got caught is because one of the kids i was with uh left his math book with his name on it in um in the place we broke into and he uh he was already on probation you know he was a cool kid uh he was already on probation and so he ratted everybody out and um yeah we got arrested i was 14 years old arrested my first time um yeah so i got i got a year of probation um, year probation after that, and uh, the um, so after I was, um, after I was off probation, you know, I thought I was, um, that would make me cool in school, which it didn't, not really. I was still the dork. Um, kids at school, they wouldn't, um, in middle school, I was picked on a lot. Um, I was this really skinny kid with big ass glasses on my face, and uh, you know, a prime target for uh, 
pick, being picked on and bullied and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that was, um, I never, never got beat up or anything, but, you know, it was just like stuff like you'd tease you or they'd, uh, knock your books out of your hand when you're walking down the hall and, you know, just stuff like that, just being jerks. But, um, one time we are playing, uh, football in, uh, like football in gym class and um of course i was picked last because nobody knew anything about me but i was picked last and um i didn't know anything about me either but <laughs> nobody was uh i was i went out for a pass nobody was uh re- nobody was covering me or anything because you know i'm that kid that gets picked last and i caught the ball and ran for a touchdown so <laughs> that's so, that shocked the crap out of me. And then the next play, next time we got the ball, two guys on me, because they knew what happened last time. The guy just threw it. Like, and I just ran, ran, ran. I go for it. I caught it. I got pummeled. They freaking just gang tackled me, but I held onto the ball. And I think I gained some respect after that <laughs> over a football game. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Sports sports can be that, that for people at times. Yeah. 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 Um, so good. I could hear, like, when I went to my next class, I can hear the other kids talking about the catches. And I was like, just sitting over there, like, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't cool after that, but, you know, I gained some respect. So the bullying stopped. It, it didn't really tease me as much. So I don't know how I caught those balls, but I did. I was gonna ask. <laughs> and it uh, kind of changed my life. <laughs> I was gonna yeah, ask. I, had you been good at sports at all before then? You know, like playing at home or something, and just never got to show out in front of your friends, or was this just? Yeah. Um, when I was ten years old, my dad put me in little league baseball. Um, you know, a little late because most kids uh, are five or so when they start. Right. But um, he put me in that my first year. I didn't know anything about baseball. I was just, um, you know, they told me to play center field and I stood behind uh, pitcher's mound. I thought that was the center of the field. <laughs> like, where are you playing? I'm like, center field. They're like, that's back there. And I turn around and look and like, there's this whole other field out there. <laughs> <laughs> I love like, it. Wow. Yeah, I didn't. But once um, after my first year, like after that season ended, our team good, did good. I, I got hit by a pitch once. and. I made it to first base that year, but that was about it. Um, then that summer after that base after that season ended, it was just like I would just practice every day. I wanted to just get better and better. And then, you know, I'd throw the ball against the, the concrete steps in front of our house every day and just um I got good. I got I played. Um the next year I got really good. I uh, was a starting pitcher. Um and I played uh, shortstop, pretty much every position they wanted me to play, I played. And I was more like a leadoff hitter, you know, always getting on base, always scoring runs. So that's where my uh, interest in sports came. And then after that, it was just, I loved baseball, I loved football, and um, it was just my life for a while. <laughs> so you were you were the sleeper pick in, in the football game. Nobody knew that. Yeah, were, nobody knew. Yeah, you exactly. were sandbagging. You you had something to, sh- to prove and something to show, and nobody knew it. So yeah, that exactly. Had to feel good. That had to feel. Really oh, good. it did, man. It really did. Glasses went flying off my face. I didn't even care. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't see the shit afterwards, but I was like, "Yeah, I made that catch. Holy crap!" <laughs> so that kind of changed my life in a way, yeah. for the better. So, um, yeah, but anyway, I was on probation for a year. Um, they went, I went to a um, job. They had a job training program. So I, um, gave, got, I got a job doing, uh, um, they had an adult daycare, right? The town I grew up in for elderly that can't take care of themselves when their kids are working or whatever. So that was fun. Um, I like serve lunch, call bingo numbers and, you know, stuff like that. I, I, I enjoyed that. That was one good thing about that that happened. Um, so yeah, I did that for 
one summer. Um, and then after probation, um, cause my, my, my mom kept a, like a really tight grip on me when I was on probation. I couldn't really go too far. I was grounded for pretty much that whole summer. I could, uh, go to work and back and that was about it. Um, so after that, um, I was, uh, I'd hang out, there's a local arcade. Um, I'd hang out there all the time, uh, you know, just, uh, smoking cigarettes and being, uh, you know, a rebellious teenager and, um, met some cool people there, some older teenagers. Um, this one guy, I thought he was like the coolest guy. And he could have, uh, you know, he could have pretty much any girl he wanted. And um, I'm guessing he was at least 18, 18, 19, because he had his own truck, um, his own apartment. And, um, you know, he befriended me um, for, he wanted, he, like, he asked me if I wanted, he owned his own DJ service. Um, he'd like do weddings and stuff. And he'd ask, he asked me a couple of times if I wanted to, uh, you know, help him out and stuff like that. And, um, but I, I went to a couple of weddings with him and we did those. Um, I was like, oh, you know, this guy wants to be my friend, which is fine with me. You know, he's like pretty popular and, uh, not me, but, um, so yeah, we'd hang out, um, and there's this other group of friends that we'd all hang out and we went down to this, um, in the woods, there's this, uh, train trestle that goes over the, the creek. So we'd hang out under that. Um, that's where I started drinking for the first time. Um, in this particular time I was, uh, um, pretty drunk. We're taking, uh, beer balls and just squishing them into our face. <laughs> and you know get just getting trashed and um everybody would leave after a while you know everybody faded out and me i i couldn't say all right i'll see you later no i could never do that because i don't know why i would do that I'm just like uh, i'll stay till the end i don't know how to say goodbye well it's almost leave. like we were taught to uh follow other people and exactly not be yeah. able to speak up for ourselves or that's gotten me in trouble a few times just not just follow whatever everybody else is doing. But anyway, I was, I was really drunk. And, um, this guy, he asked me if I wanted to ride home and, um, I was like, okay, yeah, sure. You know, um, but he said, you probably shouldn't go home because, uh, you know, you're pretty trash and your parents probably get pissed off at you. So he's like, come back to my place and we'll get, um, we'll get you sobered up. So, um, Went to his place, uh, and I sat down on his couch. I was on the verge of passing out. Um, then he started talking to me. He's like, um, I know this girl that likes you and, um, she wants to know like what you can do sexually, you know, can you do this? Can you do that? And, um, I didn't know anything about it. You know, I, I never even had a sexual thought, nothing. So I was like, uh. I'm like, you know, fading in and out. Then um, he kept getting closer to me and closer to me. And then uh, he stuck his hand in my pants. And um, I didn't respond. I had no response. He was, he's like, uh, well, I guess she doesn't want you. Um, this is what a real man does. And then um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, he raped me. Mm. And um, I didn't speak of that either. So um, after that happened, um, I don't remember if I passed out for a little while. I think I might have passed out for a little while. As I woke up, um, he wasn't there anymore. I don't know if he just took off or what he did, but I just got up and I left. Um, this is on the other side of town from where I live. And there was this kind of a woodsy area 
with a trail that I, I didn't want to walk like through town down the main road. So I just walked through the, uh, through the woods, um, just trying to comprehend what happened and why it happened. Um, but in hindsight, you know, he was grooming me for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, always offering me cigarettes, giving me rides here and there. Um, just, uh, craziness so uh, yeah i went i walked through the woods i just uh i sat down on a stump or something and just sat there and cried for like an hour or so so i like kind of sobered up and i was kind of comprehending what was happening to myself and i just i went home i went straight to my room and i never spoke of that again i didn't go to the arcade for a while after that because every time i go to go i see his truck there or so i'd avoid him as much as i could um i don't i think i might have seen him once or twice since that's happened and just kind of like shrugged it off like nothing happened i think he tried talking to me once after that but um i just stayed away from him after that and i I don't think I've seen him since. But um, uh, again, <clears throat> I'm so sorry that happened to you. Um, it's yeah. really, it's just making so. I think a lot of times that kids that are bullied um, are bullied at home and stuff first. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it sets kids up, you know, when we, when we grow up, I was bullied relentlessly as well. And it started at home. Uh, my dad was the biggest bully and, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it sets kids up, uh, to be prey mm -hmm. in some ways when yeah, we're vulnerable we're, for sure. Yeah. We're vulnerable. And we, because we just, I mean, you're just a sweet guy who wanted a friend and uh, he was giving know, me attention. Yeah. He's yeah. giving you attention because you weren't getting it elsewhere. Right. And, and you weren't getting it in positive ways and you weren't being taught how to value yourself and no one was building up your self-esteem. Right. Like, mm -hmm. and then you, you, it's just this, this, this vortex that you get sucked into and then it just makes it easier for people to take advantage of that predators find prey you know and mm -hmm. i'm just just really sorry that happened to you um you know again just touched briefly on the whole codependency thing earlier you, you know um a lot of times people will say well you know codependent people attract narcissists and i mean yeah the predators do try tend to try to find their prey but also mm -hmm. you know we let them hang around or we uh, we don't know how to say no to them we don't know how to push them away we don't know how to take a stand for ourselves because nobody's ever taught us right you know these are things that you should learn you know how to speak your mind how to ha value your own thoughts and feelings and opinions and um to had the freedom to search for greater things and just all these things that you're never going to be taught in a cult. You're never right. going to be taught in these situations. And, um, and I'm just sorry that, sorry that it sets you up in certain ways, you know, not saying that it's all just that, it, you know, right. things are complex and complicated, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, you didn't deserve that. You deserve better than that. So, um, and how did that, like, so you're in an environment where you're being taught that, like, people in the world are bad and evil. Mm -hmm. And then you're having these experiences. Did that, like, make you think, oh, well, the witnesses are right. And, you know. Yeah drive that home for you it did um for a while i like um periodically we'd go to the kingdom hall um 
you know, it was tough for my mom, especially all of us. Once we all hit teenage years, um, kind of all went and did our own thing. My mom tried to keep us together. Like I'd go with her. You know, I was a mama's boy, of course. So I, you know, anything to appease to her, I wanted to, you know, so I'd go, um, we'd go, we didn't really go out in service as much when we were older. Um, after a while, my mom, see, my mom was molested also when she was a kid by her stepfather. And um, that's another, that's a reason why I didn't um, want to bring any of that up to her. You know, I'm like, I just, I just couldn't bring myself to say anything to anybody because, you know, I, I'd question myself. I'm like, am I gay? Um, I think I like girls. I'm pretty sure I like girls, you know. But, um, I always had that shame in the back of my head, but I always wanted to, you know, please my mother and um, make her happy. But she was going like later on, she was going through a lot of stuff herself um, with the mental health issues, uh, everything coming back to her. Um, she would cut herself. Like um, she was, she became a cutter for a while. Uh, and she had to be, um, She'd be in the hospital for days or weeks on end, um, mental health hospital. And um, those days, they, they were pretty rough, you know, trying to navigate around that and um, trying to comprehend what is going on, you know. So, of course, I'm worried about my mom. So I push all my stuff aside, um, you know, just push everything down and, you know, nothing ever happened. I'm fine. And, you know, I'm worried about everybody else. So even when, um, even if I did want to bring it up, I'm like, I don't want to bring that sadness to somebody else. You know, I'm worried about their, like, we're having a good conversation. Like I was talking to my older sister last night and I almost came out and said it, but I just, we were having such a great conversation that I didn't want to turn it up. You know, like all, all of a sudden, boom, yeah, this happened to me. And then, you know, I, I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me or anything like that. Well, I, just, I don't think that uh, <laughs> I don't think that um, well, nobody wants anybody to feel sorry for them, right? Right. So uh, you know, a man falls in a hole. Uh, sympathy is standing at the top of the hole, looking down at the man in the hole and being like, "Ah, sorry, you're down there." Mm. Empathy is getting down in that hole with the person and saying it's going to be okay. And, you know, being there with the person and, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm just being struck by all this as you're saying this, you know, again, I just met you. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm you know, this is, this is all new to me as well. Right. Um, but, um, you know, your whole family, I think what, what what's striking me and, and what, what's, what is sad is that all of you were dealing with your own traumas. All of you had your own well, I can't say all. I'll say you, your mom, and your dad, maybe your sisters as well. I don't know. Sure, at some point. Yeah. Um, likely just the way things are going here. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, everybody, like, I think you all, all actually had something you could have. Um, I don't know if I really want to say the word bonded around, um, like trauma bonding or whatever. But mm -hmm. you all, all, you know, have been through a lot. And yep. I think you all, all like, it's like everybody needed help to get yeah. healthy from their individual traumas. And, and, you know, I think you all are all probably more alike than you even know in a lot of these ways, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just, yeah. um, I just, everybody deserved better and I wish everybody could have got help and had some healthier things and then maybe helped others. You know, if your parents could have got healthy, they could have maybe helped you kids uh, feel comfortable coming to them with your issues. And right. then, um, you know, that could have been a strength. I'm not blaming your parents. I'm just saying that, you know, know it's a shame saying. that, you know, and help back then maybe wasn't as readily available and, you know, mm. and then just the, the mentality of the shame around these things, especially back then. So, um, again, yeah. uh, kudos to you for being strong enough to talk about this stuff 
because um, you know maybe if everybody could have or would have, people could have got help. Right. You know? Yeah. During the time, you know, when I was getting in trouble and stuff, my dad did try to have us go to family uh, therapy counseling. Um, I never opened up. I couldn't. I I was shy. I was you know. They asked me questions, you know, yes or no, or I never really got into, you know, everything that was going on with myself. And so I, I pretty much shut down um, I'm talking to a stranger. I don't know this person, I'm, especially with my family in there. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to like have it all be about me. I never wanted it to be about me ever. Like I was always, you know, concerned about everybody else and just push my stuff aside. Well, yeah, and if you can't open up to your own family, um, maybe more difficult to do so with a stranger could be, uh, you mm -hmm. know, depending on. Especially with my family in there in the same room, and, and yeah, I just couldn't open up. Yeah, I was, I was just shy, and you know, just kind of reclusive. And again, not being taught because they probably didn't feel this way themselves either, but not being taught how to value your own feelings and your own thoughts and to express those things. You know, we were in an organization that, you know, pounded scriptures into our head, like, you know, the heart is treacherous. Don't trust your own heart. Don't lean upon your own understanding. You know, we were constantly bombarded by messaging that was you know, you're not good enough. Uh, you can't trust yourself. You need to trust us. Uh, we'll yeah. tell you how to think and feel. And, yep. and so, you know, in, in that gaslighting process and in doing that, you're separated from valuing yourself and your own identity and your own thoughts and feelings. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's a setup for failure in so many ways. And I'm just, I'm sorry that it, you know, you had to experience these things again, not all because of Jehovah's witnesses, but right. um, that mentality is always there. <laughs> yeah. How, where were you ever going to know to stand up for yourself or how to, or right. Yeah. You were yeah. just trying to get love and attention from external sources because you weren't, we weren't taught how to have that internally. Yeah. And I could never have my own opinion or, yeah, you know, so I never uh, expressed any, anything like that. Yeah, man. So where did you go from that moment, from that, you know, sitting and crying alone? Where did you, how do you pick up your life from there and move forward? Um, after I, you know, just suppressed all that, um, I just pushed it away and I was like, that didn't happen. Um, I'll never speak of that again. Um, Avoided him at all costs. And I just moved on. I, uh, I met another one of my best friends um, in middle school. Uh, we met in seventh grade, but really started hanging out when we got into high school. And we would hang out every day, all, all day, every day. Um, that's my man, Louie. <laughs> he... Uh, He's great. His um, his mom, um, she made me a birthday cake on my 16th birthday. Kind of threw me like a little party at his house. So I'm forever grateful for that. Um, so yeah, we were like inseparable for a long time. Um, he uh, he was one tough son of a bitch. He uh. He took no shit from nobody. Um, if uh, some, he wouldn't um, be beyond fighting somebody just because they didn't like him or something. Or he fought on my behalf once. He was just a. He was he was great. He's a really great friend. Um, we still hang out. To, uh, we reconnected on Facebook actually. Um, well, yeah. Um, his, I was friends with his sister on Facebook. I always wondered what happened to him, where he went. Um, then she told me that her father died, their father died. So I kind of, I went up to his funeral and we, we've hung out ever since. Um, we go to car shows and stuff. He's got a, um, 
it's got a few uh, classics in his garage that um, hopefully one day he'll let me drive. <laughs> Especially the Mustang. He's got a Mustang, 68 Mustang. Uh, I think a 69 Chevelle. A few other ones. Um, but yeah, he's a really good friend. Um, we, uh, when I was in high school, his uh, he lived close to the high school. Um, we would uh, have open lunch for, um, we could go out off the campus and we'd go to, there was a McDonald's or another store, whatever, we could go off campus. But then we'd just go to his house and not go back to school. But we'd just hang out at his house and, or we'd go for the first half. Yeah, we'd go for the first half, go to lunch and then just not go back, just hang out at his house all day. <laughs> Stuff like that, but yeah, he's uh, he's the first one I went trick or treating with too. Um, we How just, were you when you did that? When you went trick or treating, were you like sixteen then? Sixteen, yeah. Oh, six, that's awesome. I think that was the year that um, kind of coming into myself. Um, went to my first concert that year. Um, Guns and Roses. That was fun with a bunch of my friends. Um, yeah, uh, trick or treating. I was 16. Um, <laughs> we put dresses on and just went out as uh, ugly women. <laughs> we had like you know a little peach fuzz on our face, our sweet mustaches. <laughs> so, sweet 16 year old mustaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah was, you know <laughs> the, the leftover milk from breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, so the first uh, door we knock on, it's um, one of my JW classmates. <laughs> ironically enough it was yeah he never really liked me for some reason he'd always like um it's like spy on me like oh my god i saw him smoking a cigarette i'm telling i'm telling somebody his dad was an elder and you know he was that type of kid so <laughs> knock on his door he, he looks at us and he recognizes me and he looked straight into my soul and says we do not celebrate halloween here slam the door <laughs> and my friend jimmy louie he knew that uh um he knew i was a witness he didn't care yeah, i think he's the one that corrupted me to, to to get out of it um i don't think he had to try yeah. too hard he looked at me and i can hear him just <gasps> do that type of thing and it's like eh, it is what it is so we just went on and we Went to a few other houses, you know, it's just, it was new to me. I didn't know what was coming on, but, but I knew that about the knocking on the doors and <laughs> how much I knew. <laughs> Instead of giving. On doors, so it came yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> that, that part I knew about, I just didn't know about the receiving part. I knew about giving, you know, you have a tract, but yeah, I got like a, between us, we got a pillowcase full of candy and that was fun. It was, uh, it was fun. His mom uh, let me take her card to do my road test too. So she was like, she was like a second mother to me. His family was my second family. Um, so uh, yeah, I hung out with him a lot and I'm really glad that we uh, reconnected uh, four or five years ago. We've, I found him on, uh, well, through, through his uh, dad dying which is sad, but it was nice to reconnect with them. And we go out for coffee, catch car shows and stuff like that in the summer. So it's nice to stay in touch with people. No, man, I'm, I'm glad that uh, I'm sure that was a really big deal at that point in your life to it was. have somebody that um, it sounds like his mom and he and his mom like these people in this little group, um, they saw you, they felt you, they w wanted to validate you. They, they mm -hmm. enjoyed just your company for your company. Right. They, you're just, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. They didn't want anything from me. No. You know, Yeah. if nothing else, they were giving to you. Yeah. And that felt really good. <laughs> man, <laughs> Even I, though I, I was, I, I, I was awkward and I didn't know how to receive, you know? <laughs> sure. But man, what a, what a Looking wonderful back. thing when people, when people have somebody like that come into their life, uh, especially yeah. with all this other stuff going on. Good. Right. Yeah. Good for those, 
good human beings. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He's they they were definitely uh, good people. Definitely, um, we'd go camping. He his uh, parents had a camp up in the Adirondacks. Um, it was like an old mobile home on just like fifty acres of land. So his dad would go up and hunt and stuff, and we'd just go up and hang out and just walk around. And uh, it's so nice up there, man. Just I know you said you'd been there, the um, Adirondacks. Oh yeah, beautiful, beautiful place. Beautiful, yeah. So just to be there. Like every, everywhere I went looked like a postcard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's so much scenery. Doesn't matter where you are, lakes and everything else. Yeah, we'd. Uh... So I gotta ask. So your mom was this witness who kind of kept a tight leash on you, at least during the probation time. Mm -hmm. What I mean, as a witness mom, typically there's going to be that tight leash. Right. So how did you get to go do all this other stuff? I think uh, after after a while, um, she kind of like checked out as a parent. That's not like crazy check out, but she would she was more lenient. She she didn't want to um, keep me from doing things, I guess. But you know, I'd had to definitely had to gain her trust. So. Um, yeah, it was Were not, you still going to meetings and stuff through all of this? Um, periodically, just here and there. Okay. Yeah, just um, you know, typical teenage stuff. Uh, she'd ask me once in a while if I'd go to the meeting with her because you know nobody else was around or available. So I'd go with her just to uh, you know, appease to her. Um, then I I think uh, I was seventeen. I just. Uh, I just stopped going. I didn't really feel the need to go anymore. It was just, to me, it was boring. It was just every time you go, it's the same old, same old this, same old that. And the same kid would get the same answer every time he was called on because Jehovah. And that was his answer. And it was like, yeah, it's very good. That, just shit like that, I remember. <laughs> it's like so annoying. But yeah, I just, I don't know. I was a teenager. I'd rather be doing other things. Um, I mean, I did go to the memorial when I was 17. I think 18 was the last time I went. Um, then after that, I was just like, hmm. I just didn't feel like it. But, you know, you see those people, oh, I'd like to see you at the hall or at this and that. And then um, like I'd always say, yeah, okay, maybe I'll be there. And I was like, I can never go there again. It's just weird. I was going to ask, you know, that that kid that you knocked on his door out in service who mm -hmm. always had it out for you anyway. Yeah. Did, uh, did anything come of that? Did uh, he run off and tell his elder father and did his elder father yeah. contact your mom or something? Yeah, I did get in trouble for smoking. Um, oh, I meant around the trick-or-treating, but I'm smoking. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I don't think anything came of that. Huh. That I remember. Um, he might have said something, but I think at that point, my mom was just like, um, well, he's probably just going to do whatever he wants anyway. So, but I don't, she never talked to me about it that I can recall. And you weren't baptized, so it's not like you could get no. into a scholarship. Or and that was probably my saving grace, too, that I wasn't baptized. Um, my dad, you know, he wanted us to wait until we were older to make that decision. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> but, you know, I'm still... I still have relatives in and, you know, I see him on Facebook here and there, but I, we, we don't really talk. Um, my cousin used to come to my house, you know, on Saturday mornings and preaching. And the last time he preached, I was, this was like a few years ago and maybe a little bit longer. And I was just like, I just don't, first time ever, I was just like, I just don't believe that. You know, I actually came out and said that. And, since then, you know, just a couple text messages here and there, like right around when his father passed away, and that was about it. But, um, yeah, they don't really, we don't really associate from, with many other of our JW family because, you know, we're bad news. So, so they don't, so, so you're not baptized. No, none of my yet, sisters were either. And yet, you say none of your sisters were either? Right. And yet, your 
you and I guess probably even your sisters, but we'll, we're just talking about you. So mm -hmm. you then are kind of shunned by your Jada, your, your witness relatives because. Yeah, I would say so. Um, soft shunned maybe, if you will. I mean, yeah. at least, it, um, I know I've seen one of my, I think my, my uncle's wife. Well, she's my aunt, aunt by marriage. I've seen her at, uh, I think I seen her at like a store or something, a grocery store, and you know, I, I'm walking along and then I just see her quickly turn away. So it's like avoid avoidances in you know, they avoid then it's like whatever. It's really no laws because I'm not really we're not really having been in their lives since we were kids. So I'm not missing out on much, I don't think. But it's still it's still uh yeah, it's still silly, you know. Yeah, it is. They should be able to say hi. You you were never yeah. even baptized, so right. They have no reason really to shun you. And in mm -hmm. fact, you know if 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 they truly love Jehovah and if they truly care about people and want them to be saved, and if they truly believe that the message they have is what is necessary to save other save your life. Um, then shouldn't they be making an effort to be nice to you and uh, to have so. a relationship with you? Because it's much easier to get somebody to take a step with you if you've got your arm around them, you know, as a friend right. than it is, you know, from afar when you're, you won't even talk to them. It's, yeah. it's absurd. Exactly. Uh, but they behave that way. Mm -hmm. It's that mentality again, man. Everything comes back to that. Yeah. So what happened with, so your, your mom and dad were baptized though, right? Um, as far as I know, they were, I'm pretty sure my dad was, my mom, I'm pretty sure, pretty sure they were. Um, and we never really got to talk about, I mean, I never really talked about any of that stuff with them, but I'm assuming they were. Um, so yeah, my mom, she was just always gung ho about going to the meetings and um, all that stuff. But um, yeah, my dad just said, wait until when you're old enough, if you want to make that decision, it's on you, but you don't have to. So you just kind of walked away then, did your, mm. and again, you ne let's also, again, let's establish you didn't, fully embrace it or, or, or take that step of baptism right did, did your mom ever shun you or or was she always your mom and dad they always treat you uh with respect or you know yeah 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 they never shunned me um Good. my mom didn't no she probably never would have either um yeah we, um she was i'm sure she was disappointed but you know she didn't force she didn't force us on, force it upon us anymore. Later on, you know, when we were teenagers, we we're gonna do what we were gonna do anyway, regardless. So, um, yeah, that was. Uh, um, um, yeah, she never would have shunned us ever. I don't think. Did you have any? friends or anyone at the kingdom hall that today shun you mm, i really didn't have any friends there just okay, that one like it, but that one family that one, the, yeah. um well my mom and her mom were pregnant at the same time her with her son me with my son she had um they were we were like a week or so apart so we were pretty close for a while when we were younger and then after a while they disappeared so um, yeah, they stopped, they stopped going to meetings and all that. Um, I don't know their story, but I recently, uh, connected on Facebook with his, uh, the mom. Mm -hmm. So and she's not a witness anymore. So good for her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and know? that's gotta be kind of cool to connect, to see her again. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing her, you know, I was a little kid when we used to go to her, um, house. Now seeing her seeing me as an adult and just it's, it's cool she's nice she's a sweet lady and 
so how did I guess I don't know. So how did life play out for you? I think you said you're 46. So just you know how you, you left the religion at 18, basically 17, 18, kind of just net pieced out on that. We're done yep. with it. Um you know, is it something that has come up for you a lot in life, you know, since then? You know, did you need to deprogram from any of the beliefs? Um, how did um, it affect you? It's up to a few years ago, I was still mentally in. Okay. Like, in the back of my mind, I was always like, what if they're right? You know, what if um, all that? But... um you know, after doing research, now that I can, you know, have my own opinion and look at things at apostate websites or whatever, and seeing, um, I see one person say, uh, what do they say? Um, that would you want to be on earth with 8 million other Jehovah's Witnesses and nobody else? <laughs> and I said, even if they're right, no, thanks. Because they are so judgmental, in my experience, they're they're very judgy, and um, no, I would not want to be on the world full of Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> I avoid them now as it is, so why would I want to do that? <laughs> you know? Yeah. But. Can you imagine living forever, having to go out and? preach at least for the first thousand years to try to yeah. like make sure everybody well maybe not the whole thousand years whatever to make sure That's that enough. people know jehovah and, and yeah. all that and still have to worship jehovah because he's that insecure he's gonna need you to do that forever because you gotta prove right. every day that you love him um, oh, yeah. you know that's yeah. that, that's a good, that's a long time man <laughs> oh it really is yeah i believe it <laughs> But another uh, quote I saw online, somebody said, um, I would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. Hmm. I, I took that to heart. I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or even serving on earth. Yeah. So serve me for once, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, look at that. Just think about that. The, 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 the subservience that comes with that mm -hmm. um and you know you've touched this, there's kind of been a theme throughout this whole thing you know you've had a hard time standing up for yourself speaking up for yourself worry you've been worried about everybody else's feelings well of course we were made to feel like we had to serve right everything was about serving the needs of others uh, whether it was jehovah or the elders of the uh, brothers and sisters or, you know, the congregation, the organization, whatever, everything was about not stumbling anyone else, making sure everybody else is happy uh, mm -hmm. and to the expense of yourself oftentimes. So yep. um, we just weren't taught how to stand up for ourselves or be ourselves or even who we, to figure out who we were. Um, right. So was there anything in particular that helped you to, I guess, wake up from some of that, some of those feelings that you had? Um, obviously, there were some quotes you've mentioned here, some mm -hmm. lines of thought or reasoning, um, some perspectives, but I don't know, were there any books, channels, anything that helped you along the way? Um, yeah, when I first started, uh, it was maybe five or so years ago. I was just like, yeah, it was like right when my uncle died. Um, I'll get onto that later, but uh, I was just like, why does this religion still have a tight grip on me, you know? And then I just started Googling everything, like JW, this and that, and then, you know, Lloyd Evans stuff came up, and then came across your podcast first, and I, I listened to that, your this JW life. Mm -hmm. um, I related a lot to it, except for the part where you came in later in life, but I related to that a lot, and um, and then you announced shunned and I was hooked. <laughs> and yeah, I like when I'm at work, I just listen to it all the time. And I relate to a lot of the stories and, you know, it really helped me be like, okay, I got to get this crap off my chest and this is a good platform to do it. And I thank you for that. Um, this is going to help. This is going to help tremendously. 
it's going to help me to heal and um, just get, get on with my life. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you I, know? I love that. And you're going to get to help others as well, you know, who've been. Yeah. So what I'm, if I can help one person, then, you know, that's my job is done. Yeah, absolutely. I think after that's a bonus. <laughs> absolutely. Well, I'm sure I'm sure uh, somebody out there will be impacted by it for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess what what else would you like to talk about as far as, you know, you said something about talking about when, you know, when your uncle died, um, you know, where do you want to go from, let's say, 18 to, to now, uh, how your life progressed? Okay. Um, when I was, uh, I was a senior in school, high school, um, I really wanted to join the army, mm-hmm. but you know, uh, I was talking to a recruiter and everything, but my mom refused to let me. So of course I had to respect her wishes. So I, I didn't get to go in the army. And, um, so I dropped out of high school in 12th grade. Um, I regret that, but back then I was just, I was just a rebel, you know, I was just, um, sowing my wild oats, um, you know, just getting out in the world for the first time, really. Um, so I just, I quit school. I was just, um, I, for like two years, I did pretty much nothing, just hung out and just hung out with friends and, you know, partied and. Uh, drank and smoked and did drugs, um, you know, the typical worldly stuff. Um, I didn't really have any direction for my life at that point. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Uh, um, so after that, I met um, well, my sister, my younger sister, Alicia. She's the next one down from me. Um, she was, uh, dating this guy. Um, he was 10 years older than her, but, um, he kind of took me under his wing. Um, he owned his own landscaping business. Um, he, uh, um, so he took me under his wing He gave me a job and kind of got me out of that direction of, uh, where I was, uh, heading. But right before I met him, I, I got arrested again um, uh, with, with a, another friend of mine. I was, uh, he, he broke into somebody's house and I was a lookout guy outside and we got caught. So I ended up doing uh, weekends in jail. I did like 20 weekends in jail. Then um, it was during that time that he, uh, he offered me a job for like when I was done with the weekends, he gave me a job, um, landscaping and we even, uh, um, painted some houses, you know, stuff like that, just odd jobs here and there. But he was like, kind of, uh, guiding me in that direction, you know, kind of, he was like a big brother to me. Um, you know, and I, that's really what I was, uh, looking for. That's what I thought I had with the other guy. You know, I was, I was looking up to him. Um, and then, yeah, he took advantage of me, but, uh, um, this guy, no, he didn't. He, uh, he gave me, uh, um, gave me a chance. He kind of showed me around, you know, the, the up and up life, if you will. So, um, did that, uh, so, um, there was a girl I started dating. I was, uh, 20, 20 or 21, started dating her and, um, we dated for a couple of years. Uh, she ended up pregnant. Um, this is after, uh, after work dried up with Mark. That was Mark, um, his name. Um, yeah, I got another job at a, a factory working, um, doing hospital linen. It was, it was a really pain in the ass job, sweatshop type thing. But, um, 
I do uh, 60, 50 to 60 hours a week. Um, the second shift, we start 2.30 in the afternoon. And um, sometimes we wouldn't get done until 5 in the morning. Um, of course, I was young, so I could handle it. Um, but my girlfriend at that time, she, you know, with me working all those hours, she would uh, kind of keep me isolated from my family. So I wouldn't see them as much, but we'd do things with her family and everything. Um, so, but I did that year, it was uh, 96. Um, I went to my parent. we watched the World Series at my parents' house, um, big Yankee fans. So that was great. Um, that was the first time since I was a baby so that they won the World Series. But that was great. Um, no, they won. They won that year, and my parents celebrated their 25th anniversary that year. Um, and then um, New Year's Eve, I went over for a little while of uh, '96. Um, hung out for a little while. I didn't stay till midnight, but um, kissed my mom goodbye. And I said, I'd see her soon. Um, a week later, um, January 7th, uh, 97, um, I worked a long shift till 5 a.m. Um, and uh, I woke up late for work that afternoon. Supposed to be there at 2.30. I think I woke up at like 3 o'clock. Two thirty or quarter to three, three o'clock, somewhere like that. So I, I, um, I went to call work to tell him I was going to be late. So I, uh, um, I went to use the phone, the cordless, and it was, uh, it wasn't charged. It was off the cradle. So um, I grabbed the um, backup, the one we, co we uh, the corded phone we plug in that we had for emergencies. Um, so I plugged that in. I called work, told them I was going to be a little late, and then. Um, as soon as I uh, hung up my phone, um, it, it rang and it was my sister, Alicia, my younger. Um, and she said, uh, something terrible happened. Um, my mom had a heart attack and passed away. Um, like two hours prior and she was trying to call me all morning. So, um, yeah, that, that rocked me for, took me for a loop. I was, um, you know, I was a mama's boy, so I was like really, really lost. Sure. Um, very unexpected. That's that's very unexpected. She was forty-four years old, um, just out of the blue, boom. Um, so the next few days were just like surreal to me. Um, you know, they didn't have her funeral at the Kingdom Hall. Really? Um, yeah, I'm not sure why, but they did have an elder. An elder did um, preside over her uh, funeral, but you know it was always it was all about Jehovah, um, and that we'll see her next in the next life, and all that, and Jehovah's plan for you know the new system and everything else, and it wasn't very um, personal. Just even though he was really good friends with my mom, it it wasn't personal. You know, I'm sure he was going over a script or whatever. Oh yeah, they have an outline. It's just a sales pitch for the cult yeah. and cult beliefs. It's, it has nothing to Pretty do much. with the deceased. Yeah, to try to catch all the worldly uh, patrons or whatever you call. It. Yeah. But yeah, that was um, we were really mad about that because um, you know we're expecting more from him because he was a family friend. Um, but yeah, I don't think I've seen him since then or any of those people since then. You know, especially the ones that say, well, if you need us, we'll be here, and this and that. And, you know, I hear that all the time. <laughs> um, but anyway, a couple of weeks later, months later, um, my girlfriend ended up pregnant. And um, she gave birth to my son the, um, Christmas Eve of 97. So it was... Uh, it was exactly 50 weeks, five zero weeks after my mom passed away. So she never met any of my kids. Um, now she had, um, between the five five of us kids, there's uh, 16 grandkids, um, 11 boys and five girls. So each of my sisters had uh, a mini me. 
<laughs> in some one way, shape, or form. Actually, they're not many anymore. They're like, most of them are all six feet and over. So, <laughs> but yeah, they get a little bit taste of me from all, all, all their boys. My, one, my oldest sister has four boys. So, <laughs> so you, you grew up with all the girls and they have all the boys. <laughs> yep. Exactly. It's, it's weird because my mom had all brothers. My dad had all brothers. And um, I have all sisters. Now they have a lot of boys. There's a lot of boys, which I'm happy about. <laughs> now you get to be the big brother of sorts. I mean, as the uncle, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's more like a big brother thing than an uncle thing but I'm the cool uncle from what I hear. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, a few months after my son was born, um, me and my girlfriend split up. She, she was really controlling and um, I didn't like that. You know, I was controlled my whole life. Um, that, it was a big trigger for me, for like a lot of my relationships. Like, you're going to tell me what I can't do? No, I'm doing what I want to do. So it was pretty much that mentality my, most of my life. Um, anyway, she was manipulative. She was a path pathological liar. She just lied about the stupidest things. Just it, it, There was just no reason for it either. And it just, um, I couldn't deal with it. She, uh, But right when we broke up, like the next day, she marched right to the courthouse and tried to get full custody and, you know, all the child support and all that stuff. Um, but we ended up with joint custody. Well, of course, with her having uh, physical custody, because that's New York, they always go towards the mother. I'm sure that is, it's like that everywhere. But um, yeah, after that, you know, I'd see him. I'd see him most weekends, just about every weekend. Um, just being a single dad um, with my own apartment. I had a roommate. But once we split, she pretty much took everything that we, you know, that we bought together. Well, the baby needs this, the baby needs that. Yeah, the baby needs a TV stand, you know, all that stuff. But so, yeah, I had to start over. It's not the first time. It won't be the last time or it wasn't the last time. Um, so over the next next few years, a couple of years, I had, uh, you know, a few relationships, nothing really too serious. But um, one of them, and I ended up with another son. Um, the nineteen, he's nineteen months. Uh, nineteen months from my first son being born, my second son was born. So um, we that wasn't really much of a relationship. But um, so there I was, you know, single, single dad with two babies. I didn't know anything about being a father, you know, I was, um, but I learned, I learned how not to be a father from, you know, from what I was experienced with, like, I'm not gonna be that father, you know? Um, so yeah, I was 25 years old, two boys. Um, I had, uh, had a few apartments here and there with, uh, I had roommates and then, um, after a while, I, I started dating this woman I met from work. Um, she was 10 years older than me, 10 or 11 years older than me. And, um, she moved in with me for a while, for about two years. Um, she was an alcoholic. Uh, she was very, very abusive to me, um, physically, mentally, um, Especially, you know, I, I tried like opening up to her a little, put me down, demean me. So again, I kept my my stuff down, pushed down. So um, yeah, she she got me into doing cocaine and um, stuff like that. Nothing. I think cocaine is the, mo the most I've ever done that, and um, you know, smoked weed and stuff, drank. But um, yeah, I did cocaine for a while and. That was, uh, those were like the lowest, some of the lowest points in my life. Um, she would always tear me down, tell me how useless I was. And um, she, she would get like more belligerent and um, 
she pushed me around. She slapped me. Of course, one time um, she slapped me so hard that I just, you know, I shoved her and walked out. Um, that was my way, of, you know, just get out, go walk, take take a walk, cool off. Um, but that particular night, I was um, I was just really feeling uh, like, why am I here? What what is my purpose? Why do why sh I don't even want to? Like, at that point, I didn't want to live. I wanted to, um, there was just so much going on in my head. Um, so I was like, maybe she's right. Maybe, you know, I am useless and the world would be get better off without me. So I'm just walking along, you know, I don't know if I, what I would have done that night. Um, I was really thinking about suicide. Um, then all of a sudden out of the blue, I just hear this voice call my name. And it was my man, Louie. <laughs> it this um so I I hadn't seen him in a while from that point since probably high school. It's like four or five years. And um I just turned around and he's like, hey, and his house is right there. So I walked over and um he um just asked what I was doing. I was just blow off some steam and um he invited me in uh, we chatted kept caught up um for a few hours and i met his wife and daughter um he doesn't know this but um he probably saved my life that night and <laughs> yeah i'm pretty sure i don't know how or why i would have did it but i probably would have um, just because i was just where i was mentally it was just um a bad place i was at and, but yeah, he saved my life that night and I went home happy. Um, and it kind of just changed my, uh, you know, my perspective on myself saying there are people out there that really care, you know, even, you know, he didn't know what I was going through. We just chatted about the old days and um, there's something triggered inside of me. He's like, oh man, I don't want to do this. <laughs> You know, so when I went home and she was passed out, she didn't remember anything the next day. Um, so I just, I just let it go. And then after that night, I knew our time was coming to an end. So um, about a week or so later, I got home from work and she, uh, she was gone. All her stuff was gone. And she uh, found out she went back to her husband. Yeah, she, she had a husband and a family. <laughs> Yeah, she was one of those. Uh, she was crazy. Looking back, she was mm, she was nuts. But after that, you know, she left, so I didn't really need this big apartment to myself. So, um, my guy I worked with before, Mark, he offered me um, to stay up in his attic for fifty bucks a week. Um, his attic, it was all and half of the attic was like all she rocked and everything it was all done on one side so i stayed up there for a while um and then a few months before that i started working for a vending company i'd fill vending machines for a living um being a single person back then that was um that was pretty good money i was making really good money um and uh you know me and mark we'd uh he taught me how to play guitar. So we, um, some nights we'd, uh, get our guitars out and play and the kids would dance around and just good times like that. Um, <laughs> they, yeah, they really enjoyed that. We enjoyed watching them. Of course, the dog would always get in there and chase his tail. So that was like, that would just add to it, add to the whole effect of, you know, <laughs> he's like moshing, chasing his tail. That's what we called it. <laughs> But those were fun. Those were really fun times. Um, about a year later, uh, Mark was, um, there was a bad storm, thunder and lightning storm, and um, he was out on the porch um, kind of taunting the storm, saying that he would, he had a better chance of uh, winning the lottery than getting struck by lightning. So uh, he got struck by lightning. Um, inadvertently, it was, um, 
lightning struck the tree nearby and there was an ungrounded wire that was going through it. And it kind of went through his, um, onto the, the wires went right onto the porch and it kind of zapped him. And um, he wasn't the same after that. He, uh, it, it, it messed with his uh, neurological system and he had a, like a difficulty functioning um, at times. Um, his, his work was slowing down. He couldn't really uh, focus on that. Um, so he, he tried to get a job where I was working. Um, he went for the interview, but he didn't get the job. So I don't know exactly why or what happened. Um, so uh, every night we'd, uh, we'd be up in my room playing uh, Madden, Madden football. You know, we'd play that on the PlayStation every night and um, talk about what was on our minds and stuff. And um, one night, out of the blue, he just said, uh, he wasn't sure if he wanted to go on living anymore. Um, and if anything happened to him, um, for me to take care of his kids. And, you know, I, I said, no worries, man, but nothing's going to happen. You're, uh, you'll be fine. You know, everything's going to be okay. Um, he said he was thinking about ending his life. And I just, you know, I assumed he's not going to do that. He, um, he loves his children. He loves my sister, you know. And I, I just thought he was just getting stuff off his chest. Um, so a week later, my sister had to work that evening. Um, but she asked me to keep an eye on him before uh, he left, before she left for work. Because um, he wasn't being, he seemed off a bit. Um, that was a Friday night, um, middle of January. You know, it's freezing cold out. And um, I, had, I had my boys, um, they were three and five at the time. And um, his kids, his daughter was seven and his son was five. They're up in my room playing games. Um, we, me and Mark played Madden for a bit and then he went downstairs. I had to work the next day. Um, they work, I worked some weekends. So I had to work early. So um, kids were all sleeping. I laid down. Um, right before I fell asleep, I looked, uh, I saw Mark in the doorway. Um, just briefly, and then I uh, um, closed my eyes, opened them again. He wasn't there. Um, I fell asleep. Then probably a couple hours later, my sister comes running up the stairs um, telling me to come down. She's all panicked. Um, so I went in the kitchen, and there was a note on the kitchen uh, counter, uh, short and to the point, saying, I can't go on anymore. Tell everybody I love them, and I'm sorry. I is calling. I'm in the shed hanging by six ropes. Um, I think it was six ropes uh, so he wouldn't change his mind. Um, he was dead. Um, that, that destroyed me um, more than anything. But of course, I had to um, push all my feelings aside. You know, um, and, you know, be there for my sister and kids. They were all, the whole time, they were just up in my room sleeping. Um, so that was about 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. You know, I called my work. I told them I wasn't going to be there because this happened. Um, and so to uh, like console my sister, like after everybody left and everything, um, we just went up uh, and watched uh, Back to the Future in, in my room. Um, just in shock, just trying to get our mind off of it. Um, it was just trying to comprehend what the hell happened. Um, we didn't sleep that night. Um, the kids, when they woke up, we just told them that, um, that their dad died in the sleep. And, um, I'll never forget their look on the, my poor nephew's face. It's like, my daddy died. I know, buddy. <laughs> That was hard. That was like the first time I've ever dealt with anything like that. And, you know, he was my brother. He was my big brother. I always looked up to for the last eight to 10 years. And he was gone. And he told me he was going to do it. I didn't believe him. But I don't think it would, there would be anything that I could do to change his mind. No. 
And no, true. I mean, I had um, nightmares forever. It was like every time I would not get there in time or he'd find a different way to do it. And I was just, so after a while, I was just like, he was just going to do it no matter what. There was nothing I could do about it. But um, one person blamed me for it, saying I was there and I could have did something about it. You know, all the other people said that said, no, it's not your fault. You you couldn't have done anything. The one that says that it was my fault really stuck with me. Of course, of course. You know, and um, oh, that, it, was, it wasn't your fault. That was something that Mark did. Yeah, it was, it. Mark, it was inside him. And I'm not even know that we need to blame anybody um, right right especially like right after it happened this person said that and you know of course i'm gonna say was it my fault i was there why didn't i do anything oftentimes when people say that they're just hurting and they wish it wasn't so and blame mm -hmm. makes them feel better yeah uh, to feel like yeah. there might have been some control but mm -hmm. we don't get to control other people's lives or what right. they do with that life. Mm. And um, I'm just I'm just sad that you lost your friend. I'm sad that your sister lost uh, Mark. I'm sad that, you know, the kids lost their dad. And I'm sad that Mark uh, was in that much pain inside um, that that was the only thing that he saw to do. And, um, it, you know, he was out of hope. And um, just terrible situation. Blame yeah. only makes it worse. There's mm -hmm. no, no need for that. You right. couldn't have done anything. Alicia couldn't have done anything. There's nothing anybody could do. Right. Um, and I'm not even going to say that Mark could do anything. Mark, you know, look, I've been there. You talked earlier about yourself being in that position. Mm -hmm. Um you know, it's, it's yeah. a really low place to be. It is. When you're that low, you're not thinking straight. And um, even if you could prevent someone for a moment from doing it, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't just do it tomorrow or the next day or whatever the case may be. Right. Um, people have different points in which they break. And. Mm -hmm. We yeah, he was in a breaking for point. anybody else. So um, I hope he rests in peace. I'm so sorry that that it went that way for everybody involved. And um, you know, I but I do also realize that you know when somebody does that, they have that pain inside, and that pain kind of then trickles down to everybody else. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm just sorry that you all also had to carry that burden, you know, of that pain around too. Um, it's a heavy yeah. burden, but it, yeah, was, it sure was. Um, it was not your fault. Thank you. I know everybody told me that, except for that one person. But uh, person hey, look, go read, go read the reviews for my podcast. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can always find a person on there who's pissed off about something. I was yeah. like, ah, oh, you can't please everybody, you know, like, yeah. you know, and, exactly. and so, and you shouldn't try to, um, right. don't listen to the one person that has something negative to say, listen to all the people that are supportive. And, um, you know, again, yeah. Yeah. I've come to realize that over the years, just, um, and Mark think, certainly wouldn't have wanted you to blame yourself. Right. Mark would have said. Well, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I've learned that over the years that, you know, some things you just can't, you can't control. No. Um, and screw what everybody else thinks. <laughs> I've learned that. <laughs> Instead of trying to please everybody, you know. Whatever. No, no, no. You can't yeah. please everybody. Yeah. <laughs> or should you try? Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, after that, um, the next few months after that was a blur. You know, I just drift through my day, day-to-day -day grind. Um, uh, 
I would oversleep a lot after that because I, I was having nightmares for quite a while after that. Um, they faded. Well, here and there, I'd still have them, but haven't had any in a long time. But after that, you know, I would uh, I'd oversleep a lot. Um, I'd wake up late for work, uh, trying to um, hurry up and get to work. I'd get uh, got pulled over a few times, quite a few times. Um, speeding tickets and uh after a while i just couldn't i was so overwhelmed i couldn't pay any of my fines so they suspended my license for a little while um i still but i still drove back and forth to work um because you know i had to i had no choice but um so if i still drove i was still driving i bought i bought another car at one point um so I had two cars. I uh, took the one car to uh, pick up the other car with a chain, and I had a, a friend with me. Um, and he was in the car being towed. Um, I was a few miles from where I had to go, and I got pulled over. Um, so then and, and my license came back that it was suspended. So um, there I was. They put me in the back seat of the cop car, and I sat there and watched as both my cars got towed away. <laughs> that was rough um that was that was probably the lowest one of the lowest points in my life that whole like four or five month um you know time period after mark died um well during that time mark died too sure um that was just it was a, such a dark place for me so um um they gave me a bunch of tickets they uh they waited for um, they let me call my sister to come pick me up, and um, so I had to call. I had to call my boss and tell him my uh, license was suspended. So, um, and he said, uh, "Well, um, you're no good to us without your license, so you're fired." So, <laughs> yeah, uh, there I was. You know, I, uh, I was still staying in the attic with my sister. Um, maybe a couple months later. Um, she, there was, um, she had this guy start coming over as she was meeting him for coffee here and there. Um, she brought him home and, um, he started coming around more often and, uh, and all of a sudden, maybe a few weeks to a month later, he was moved in and he was, um, he suddenly took charge of everything. You know, he wanted to be that alpha male that took care of everything. And, um, well, it was an, um, it was an old farmhouse, um, with, it had two apartments on the front, the front of the house. And then the back was three stories. Um, and it was, it was like out in the sticks. So without a car, I really didn't have much of an option, many choices or anything to, um, you know, to get a job. There was a little corner store down the road. I ended up getting a job at um, probably a mile and a half away. Um, it was like a little mom and pop's grocery store with a deli. So I worked in the deli for a while and we made pizzas at night. And I would, my, <laughs> I would ride my son's bike to work a few times because, uh, you know, the little 20 inch bikes and me on it. That was, um, that was fun. Uh, not really, but um, I had to do what I had to do to, uh, because um, in the first, the, the front of the house, there was two apartments. My, sis, my sister, Adria, she was the youngest, and her husband moved in to one of the apartments. And then my sister had uh, friends that were, lived in the, the downstairs apartment. So um, when this guy came around, he was, um, you know, he wanted to take charge of everything. Um, him and my other sister, Adria's boyfriend, they never got along. He didn't, they didn't like each other. They bumped heads. Um, I, I didn't know him. I didn't really care for him. I knew he wasn't Mark. He was totally like opposite of Mark, it seemed to me. Um, it, um, so he was just, um, he didn't know it all. He has to be in charge of everything. He has to know what's going on. Everything's right, you know, his way or no way. So um, after a while, um, 
he kicked my sister and her her husband out. And then the people in the front, he kicked out. And um, I was still there. I was there for a while. Um, just uh, going back and forth to uh, work every day. Um, I would, uh, I was just trying to get my license back. Um, so I, you know, I can further my uh, choices of work or whatever. Right. Um, just, just to get out of this town. Um, so I would, yeah, I, I um, worked at the deli. I, um, I picked corn for a while just for some extra cash, just to save up. And because um, when I lost my job, I fell behind on child support for both my boys. So, you know, I, that was pretty much what I was working for, that um, to catch up on that, get my license back and uh, pay all my fines and stuff. Um, so when I was working at the deli, I met this girl. Um, we, uh, she she uh, she would give me a ride back and forth to work. Um, uh, she gave me a ride home, and we talk and hang out. Um, after a while, we ended up dating. Um, yeah, I didn't get out much because you know I was just back and forth to work pretty much. Um, didn't go anywhere unless, unless she picked me up. Um, so we we hung out um, pretty much every day. Um, uh, maybe about four or five months later, I got, I got a car and I put it on the road. Um, and so I was driving that back and forth, trying to save even more money just cause I didn't want to be, um, I didn't want to live there anymore where I was. Um, it was just so much tension. He would, uh, he, he was just controlling of everything. He controlled, um, my sister, those kids, just everything. Um, so I was just, you know, I was gung ho on getting out of there. Um, so anyway, so I was dating this girl for a little while. Um, one day we're all working at the market and, um, police came in and they, they, um, came and dragged her out of, uh, of the market and, um, put handcuffs on her and took her away. None of us knew what the hell was going on. We're like, um, so the next day her mother comes in and says that she got busted for uh, selling cocaine to an undercover cop about um, probably about a year or so before, before we even met. So um, she got arrested. Um, so I was a little concerned. So I, was, I just stuck around to see, you know, how it would play out. So um, I went to court with her and her parents and um, they were, um, they were going to send her to a, um, a shock facility. I don't know if you know, it's kind of like a boot camp for uh, young um, criminal offenders. Um, but she, um, she then announced that she was pregnant to the courtroom and to me. So um, they ended up um, sentencing her to a year in um, the women's correctional facility. Uh, it was the same one that Martha Stewart was in. <laughs> oh. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, we got that one, that going for us. For, um, so yeah, she was uh, sentenced to a year there. Um, and she was pregnant. Um, I was, I was, um, I was only able to go. I think I, I visited her once before the baby was born, and once after, because you know I had my boys on the weekends, and during the week I was working, and you know I didn't really have a lot of time to just get up and drive a couple of hours away to visit her in prison. So um, her miserable aunt, she was just a mean old lady. Um, she would always come in and to the market when I was working and why don't you go down and see her and this and that. And, um, you know, she always tried to make me feel like crap. And, um, you know, I just didn't have time, but um, I did end up going down a few times. Um, she did end up having a baby. It was uh, a girl. Um, my daughter was born in prison. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, so she was born in prison and then, um, meanwhile, um, back at home, you know, everybody was, um, all the apartments in the front were empty, um, both apartments, this guy, um, so, uh, 
everybody after everybody moved out um you know i finally had a car and i had freedom and i was able to go here and there and everything um so i went to my another one of my sisters um allison so i hung out with her you know just for a couple of days i just wanted to get out and um you know see different walls or whatever you know just get out of that house for a few days um then uh the, i went back home and uh i found out i found all the locks were changed um you know my key didn't work so um i left and then um i came back later you know because i knew my sister was home then and i looked on the porch and it was all my stuff just sitting on the porch um no explanation nothing just um i know they were home too because the cars are there the lights were on you can see shadows in the um you know the curtains on the windows see shadows behind them so um yeah they kicked me out um they really didn't give me a reason for that or anything um so i left all my stuff there i came back with a friend with a truck and you know grab all my stuff course again it wasn't much because i've always had to start over and you know but it was a truckload so uh, my friend um helped me out there and took everything um but uh yeah as i was you know got everything loaded up i looked at the window and i could see my little nephew um just sitting there with a sad look on his face um just looking up at me and i just looked down at him and i was like <sighs> then i see a shadow come and just pull him away from the window so and then I was it's like, okay, that was done. Um, that was a lot. Uh, I didn't see them after that for eight years. Which, um, that was rough. So um, I went and stayed with my other sister, Allison, so I could get some money saved, you know. Um, so I had to, uh, I, had a, I had a third child, you know. So um, my daughter was sent home. Uh, after a couple months um to her her mom's parents or her grandparents um two months before her mom got out uh they controlled everything they wouldn't let me see they was only to be able i was only able to see my daughter um in their presence um i didn't really care for that too much um so a couple months later she got out of jail um we tried to make it work um her father was really gung-ho on us getting our own place and um so after a while we we found a small house and we um we moved in for uh for a little while we um stayed there for i don't know it was a few months we um we uh really tried to make it work um again she was controlling she was on parole so um she couldn't um do anything you know it was um new year's eve i wanted to go to my sister's house um that was 2006 maybe a year after my daughter was born yeah she was about a little over a year old um so i made plans to go to my sister's house allison's for new year's um you know she she lived in the same house that my that we grew up in um after my mom died uh she stayed with my dad to help him out and stuff and then my dad ended up getting his home place um so my sister stayed in that house and um her boyfriend and her kids were living there and um so anyway i went i went there i wanted to go my girlfriend didn't want me to go because she couldn't go so why should i be able to because she was on parole she couldn't do anything so um told me I couldn't go um my boys and my daughter were there uh we were we were in the bathroom arguing um she was a little bit of a large woman well a lot of a, <laughs> she was big and um she kind of like tossed me around like I was a rag doll but then she was um she was blocking the door so I couldn't get out because I was adamant I'm like I'm gonna do what I want and you're not gonna tell me what I can and can't do so um you know she i pushed her a little bit um she grabbed onto my sweatshirt as i was starting to fall out with her um i kind of picked myself back up 
and like my sweatshirt like ripped off and the whole front just came off and I just got out of it and um took off took the boys and um we left um so I went to my sister's house again um and about an hour later her father comes barging and just barge right in the door um asking me like telling me that I hit her that she said I hit her and all that um like I beat her up pretty good um I tried you know I tried calming him down explaining what happened um but he he didn't want to hear what I was saying so he kind of lunged at me trying to hit me um and I back, I you know, I backed away. So um, and then my sister's boyfriend came out and um, told him that he was trespassing and get the hell out of there. Um, I think he thought my, uh, I think he was thought he was going for a baseball bat. He's actually going to get his shoes on. So he just took off and left. He didn't want any trouble after that. So um, yeah, that was fun. A um, couple days went by. Um, you know, I stayed there to calm down, make sure everything calmed down. Um, so I went, she called me, uh, wanting to talk and I told her, um, so I went back to the house and I just told her I didn't want to, I couldn't do this. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be with her anymore. I was done. I wanted out. Um, so you know, I had my boys with me and, uh, she left. Um, she came back maybe an hour later with um, a bunch of family members with like two or three trucks and they just cleaned the house out, cleaned out everything. My boys are playing video games. They took the video games, they took the TV, the beds they were laying on. Um, sorry, I just dropped something. Okay. Uh, you know, they were playing, they were playing video games and um, they took everything. Um, they left me with a box of my belongings, a few belongings. They didn't touch my clothes, which was good, but everything was, they just wiped everything out. And, um, I just, I was left with this little box, um, keepsakes and stuff. Some of the things that, uh, you know, the kids and my sister's kids made for me were broken. And, um, I'm pretty sure that's where my baseball collection went. My, um, very, um, prized, uh, hall of fame album, baseball cards, pretty sure i can't be positive but i think that she took them and sold them so um because she knew that was my prized possession one of them anyway so after that um i went back to my sister's house uh allison and i stayed there for a while um i stayed there for about six months um during that time um Adria's husband, the one that worked, lived in uh, one of the apartments, um, he got me a job where he was um, working at a steel shop. So I, I, I worked there for a couple of years, um, made some good money, saved up. Um, just, uh, I just vowed never to put myself in that situation again. So uh, this was uh, 2007. So um, I, I'd go to the um, public library a lot and, you know, get on the internet. It was kind of, it was new to me. I didn't really know much about it, but um, I was curious. Everything was new to me. And so um, I got on Yahoo personals um, and made a profile just to see what was out there. Um, it let you um, send one message to somebody, like break the ice saying, um, you caught my eye or whatever it said. Um, and if they did the same thing, they would, uh, you were able to send one message. I was able to send one message. The girls could uh, send what, how many unlimited. Um, so there's one girl I was, um, interested in. I, uh, clicked on her profile. I said she, um, she caught my eye or whatever. And then she did the same thing. So I sent my one message. But if you sent, um, if you tried to send like an email address or a phone number, it would block it. So um, I kind of manipulated it. I didn't put the at sign for my email address. So I just said my email address and then in Yahoo. So she was able to see it. And then she started um, emailing me. Um, so we, we were talking for a while. Um, 
she had recently just had a baby, um, maybe a few weeks before we started talking, uh, a couple of weeks before we started talking, she just had a baby girl um, and she had a job. That was a bonus. <laughs> but she really caught my eye and, um, you know, we took it really slow. Um, after a while, um, you know, we, uh, we were emailing back and forth, um, eventually moved to MySpace. <laughs> yeah, how old that is but yeah we uh then after that we started uh texting and then talking on the phone and then about a month or so later we started we um we decided to to meet up um and this was uh uh that decided to meet at a dunkin donuts um i was so nervous you know i never really done anything like that before just like a blind date type thing um I was so nervous that on the way down, I almost turned around uh, and, and turned around and went back. Uh, then I was, I was, as I was driving down the highway, I seen the no U-turn sign. So I was like, well, that's a sign that I should just keep going. <laughs> There's no going <laughs> like back down. Mind. It's yeah. a no U-turn sign. No one has ever broken one of those signs. Before. No, definitely not. So I was like, I can't go back now. This is it. So, uh, yeah, we had uh, probably would have turned around. But I took a chance. Um, we had coffee. It went okay. I was nervous, of course. I was nervous as hell, and I'm sure she knew it too. Um, but we had coffee. We went. Um, we just went for a little walk through a. It's kind of like a mall. So we went. We uh, walked through the mall. Um, there was like an art gallery. We walked through. Um, just talking and trying to get to know each other and stuff. Um, so after that, two days later, I got fired from the steel shop um, for not being able to wake up in time. Um, so I was there for about two years. I got fired two days after I met my um, this person, this girl. Um, so uh, I told her, I told her that, and um, I just got fired from my job. Uh, I don't know if you want to see me again, but she said, uh, yeah, I'd like to see you again. Um, so we arranged for a second meeting and that went well. Um, but she was uh, kind of reluctant um, for me to meet her daughter because, um, well, I guess what happened with her, her, um, her and her boyfriend split up before she had the baby. Um, so, and he had, I guess he didn't want anything to do with her. So, um, she was kind of reluctant to have me come around the baby because she was afraid that, you know, the baby would get attached to me and I would, uh, I would just up and leave, um, or whatever, for some reason. Um, so I just, I kissed her on the forehead and I'm like, and I told her I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'm not planning on going anywhere. Um. So a little while after that, uh, she let she let me uh, come around the baby, and of course I fell in love with her at first sight. So <laughs> um, father was you know he wasn't in the picture. He wanted her to have an abortion. Wanted nothing to do with it. Um, I think he saw her once when she was six months old. I was I was there at the place. He came over to see the baby. Um, I think he took a one look at me and. Um, he never came back. So I, I, I'm just assuming that he thinks I was this big giant monster that was going to kick his ass because he was only like 5'5". Five, five. <laughs> so yeah, he never came back. And um, um, I think I intimidated him. Um, but a few months into our relationship, uh, I reunited with my uncle um, on my mom's side. We haven't, um, we had a picnic. Uh, he brought my grandmother. And um, he was a Jehovah's Witness, but um, he was disfellowshipped a lot. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, but um, I, uh, when my grandma, we, uh, yeah, we had that picnic, he met my new girlfriend um, and the baby and my children. And um, he would bring my grandmother, brought my grandmother with him. And um, like a little while later, my grandmother, uh, 
um, she had a heart attack. Um, she was, um, that, um, she survived that. But she had, um, she, uh, they put her into a nursing home after that. And, uh, me and my uncle would, uh, meet for coffee. And then after that, we'd go to visit grandma and we got really close. Um, after that, we were close for about, for quite a while. We'd, um, text all day, every day. And, um, you know, we'd, uh, he'd come over our house. Um, like when he was disfellowship, he, he came over for Thanksgiving one time. Um, this was, uh, that, yeah, that was like, um, I think it was sad because, um, two out of three of his children shunned him and, um, he had one granddaughter from his daughter and he couldn't see her. They wouldn't let her see let him see her or anything. And I could see that it was like really tearing him apart. Um, which is sad, Oh yeah. you know, but, um, yeah, he'd come over to our house a lot, just probably, I think just to fill that void. Um, and one year, it was that year that he came for Thanksgiving. It was a few weeks later. He bought my, um, he bought the girls, uh, these snow globe type things like, Disney something or another. And he's like, these are not for Christmas. They're just presents. <laughs> so, you know, but um, yeah, that was, uh, those were good times. We really, um, we were really close. Uh, um, Cause he, uh, he reminded me so much of my mother. He had her sense of humor. He had, um, you know, just about all her traits. Um, so, um, oh well, yeah, um, I was, uh, I was coaching my, uh, I would coach my son's, uh, little league teams. Um, I'd alternate between, um, one year I do my one son and the next year I do my, the other. Um, so those were, those were fun times. Um. I feel like I'm all over the place here. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. I would say I, I imagine it was fun for you, somebody who loved yeah. baseball so much and mm -hmm. who got to uh, be involved, albeit at 10 years old, you know, in Little League yourself. And then to be able to coach the games and go to them and things like that, that's got to be a blast. Yeah, it really was. Um, I enjoyed that. Um, the kids enjoyed it too. Um, so I asked the girl I was seeing, I asked her, you know, that she wanted to come to one of the games, not thinking she would, because you know, little league games are boring if you're not involved in them. <laughs> if it's not uh, your kid, you're not probably going to watch. Yeah, exactly. But she came, she showed up, and uh, you know, our relationship progressed from there. Um, then the few months after we met, we moved in to her apartment. Um, but I, I still, I was out of a job for a couple months after i met her so um she was at work she was working i was out looking for jobs during the day um i had to take my car off the road um because i didn't have a job so um i finally landed one um for a, another vending company filling vending machines um that's where i've been ever since uh 14 years <laughs> um so yeah, I, I'm doing, I've been doing that. Um, that's my, when my life kind of got on the right track. Um, Can I ask, I know this may be a silly question. Go ahead. What kind of vending machines? I mean, are we talking food or like the crane machines with like, you know, uh, stuffed animals in them? Or? No, snacks, sodas. Snacks. Um, yeah, food machines and drinks. Um, it's kind of taking its toll on me. I've been doing it for I've been working for this company for 14 years. Um, gets to you after a while. Uh, my back is, you know, not what it was. Sure. But um, it's good. It's good money now. Um, uh, until something else comes along. Sure. But um, yeah, uh, after, so that's when my life really got on track. And um, uh, my, 
girlfriend, she, uh, she never questioned me about anything. She, um, never even tried, never tried to control me. Um, you know, I filled her in on about a little bit about my life, not like all every detail, but you know, she understands what I've been through. And, um, I tell her I'm going to go hang out with this friend or that friend. She's like, Oh, go ahead. Um, I'll be here when you get back. No arguing. Um, we would do things, we do things together, um, or apart, you know, she does her own thing. I do my own thing. And then we do things together. Um, she's never tried to control me ever. Um, and of course, you know, I'm like, well, this is the woman I want to marry. Um, so I, I proposed about a year or so into the relationship and, um, we got married on the date, uh, we first met two years later. Um, I was almost 35 when I got married. Um, like a couple months before I turned 35. So, um, we bought this place in, uh, this quiet town. Um, and we've been raising her daughter and my kids. Um, she's really great with my kids. Um, she treats them like her own. Um, yeah, we got married. I invited my family to, uh, our wedding minus the sister I didn't talk to. Um, my grandmother went, um, I invited my uncle, but he didn't, he didn't end up showing up, but, um, he ended up being sick at the last minute. Um, so I think it might've had something to do with him being a witness and not wanting to go to, um, a wedding that wasn't at the kingdom hall. Um, was it in not, a church? No, no, it was outside. Okay. Um, but I don't know. I, that's what I'm assuming happened. Um, I mean, he, he's been known to do that a, a few times. Um, just back out at the last minute of things. Um, yeah, it was outside. It was officiated by a mayor, mayor of the town. Um, I, I was just really happy that my grandmother made it because, uh, um, she passed away three, uh, three months later. Mm. Um, so, um, so yeah, I was grateful for that. Um, and we, uh, we went to Niagara Falls for our honeymoon, like my parents did, but there wasn't any conception. <laughs> 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 no no conception at that time uh we've decided you know we have uh together we have four kids and i think we're uh we're okay with that um we did we we did talk about um having a child together but at this point in our life we're just like um it wouldn't work out we're, we're always constantly on the go 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 and oof, having a baby around i don't think <laughs> full time uh no, because the youngest, the baby is uh, 14. Um, so we love, we love the ones we have. Uh, some, some, sometime maybe distance down the road, there's uh, room for a grandchild in our hearts, but that's um, way down the road, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so in 2013, um, I started seeing a, a therapist. Uh, cause I was, I was still having nightmares this is 10 years later from Mark's suicide and I was still having, um, nightmares and I would always try to save them in my dreams. And I just, you know, I'd never get there in time. And, um, she diagnosed me with PTSD, Sure. which I never even considered. That's the first time I like really opened up about that or anything personal. Um, cause I felt like that I had to talk about that cause, um, I was really bummed out about, you know, I hadn't seen my sister and uh, her children when I promised, you know, I promised Mark I'd take care of them. And, oh, uh, you know, it was eight years since I've seen them. And, um, she, the therapist, she asked me if I'd ever consider, uh, reuniting with my sister. Um, I didn't know at that point. I, was, I didn't think it was uh, possible because um, when my grandmother was in the hospital and she was dying, um, my sister and her boyfriend were there. Alicia and her boyfriend were there and they were, um, she just acted like I wasn't there. Like um, it was almost like she was a witness and I was an apostate. She just turned her back on me, walked away. I have no idea what I did to make her feel that way. 
ever. So, um, yeah, I always wondered why, what I did. And, um, uh, a few weeks after that, uh, therapy session, um, I got word that Mark's father passed away. Um, I, I liked Larry. He was, I was pretty close with him. And, um, so me and my younger sister, Adria went to his funeral and we didn't even think of it, but my sister and the kids were there, uh, my nephew and niece, and, um, they were all grown up. <laughs> it was like eight years later and, you know, they were teenagers and, uh, oh my God. But then, you know, me and my sister saw them, our hearts were pounding like, oh my God, oh my God, are they gonna be able to talk to us? And then, um, I could see both Paige and Nate, they were looking at their mom and she said, yeah, go ahead. So, um, they came over to us and, uh, it, it was just fantastic. Um, my niece, I was like, you guys remember me at all? She, she's like, yeah, can you do all the goofy voices or silly voices he used to do? And I'm standing next to Larry, I'm standing next to poor Larry in his uh, coffin. I'm like, uh, I can, but I'm not going to try to do it now. <laughs> but, um, yeah, she, they remembered all the goofy stuff I do, um, when I, when they were little and, uh, uh, a couple of weeks later, um, they invited us over for a cookout. Um, that wasn't easy to do for me. Um, I walked, you know, but I did. I felt like um, I felt like I had to. I wanted to. Um, but I knew it was kind of a part of my healing process. Um, but yeah, after that, uh, I tried getting along with her. Uh, boyfriend you know just for the sake of uh for, for the sake of my sister and everybody um so for a while we were all right we'd hang out and stuff um he'd uh help me out and things and i you know i'd help him out and um but he, i just don't feel like he's like brother type you know always in the back of my head what he did um, back then just threw everybody out and that's always in the back of my head. I mean, I try to make peace, but, um, You're it's allowed to have your own feelings. Yeah. Now I know this, <laughs> I can have my own and not worry about everybody else's. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't really see my sister any, um, I see my sisters once in a while. Um, not that often, but I like, to, I, um, I try to make an effort to, um, you know, at least try to have coffee with one of them or meet up or whatever. I mean, pandemic that kind of, uh, took all, a lot of that away, but, um, you know, I try to, uh, just be, um, the, not all of my sisters get along with each other. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of the, uh, the mediator between everybody so i kind of um 2014 I, I i just wanted to get all my sisters together and my father and um uh so i arranged for all of us to meet up it, it was first time we were all together um since my mother passed away uh 17 years prior um so we met up at the local pizza hut and uh my dad thought it was just going to be him and me but um, when he got there, all his children were there waiting for him. <laughs> so he loved that. He was in his glory. Um, and that summer, uh, I planned a family reunion uh, at the local state park. Um, that went that went good. Everyone, everything went along good. Um, everybody got along. Um, there was a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses there. Um, my uh, um, aunt and uncles. Uh, that that day, you know, everybody got along, and there was nothing, no tension or anything. Um, so everybody got along, and uh, that was good. Um, my grandmother was there. My dad's mom. Um, she actually just turned a hundred this year, in January. Oh, wow, very cool. Yeah. So uh, God bless her. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, yeah, 
so after that, um, I, I continued my relationship with my uncle Dale. Um, he invited me and my wife and my family to, uh, my other uncle's house, um, for Labor Day cookout, uh, one year. And, um, he was a witness, um, probably just the same as I was up to I was a teenager and then he didn't want to do it anymore. So he's, um, he's a worldly uncle, but, um, he's, uh, and I got to know my cousins that I hadn't seen, um, since they were babies. My cousin, Jessica, I just, uh, it was yeah 2014 we reconnected um but i didn't see her since she was a baby and we kind of reconnected on facebook for you know for a couple of years and then finally i saw her there and um she's great she's a wonderful she's uh she's sweet she's a wonderful person um we've gotten really close over the past few years um and you know she invited me to her wedding um which was nice. And, um, yeah, I have a really good relationship with her. Um, she's probably one cousin that I do have a relationship with. Um, she wasn't a Jehovah's witness ever. And, you know, she's a genuine person. Wow. <laughs> a worldly generous, genuine person. Who would have thought that, you know? So, um, yeah, my uncle, uh, um, like a little while after that, um, he, he got sick and, uh, um, he passed away. Um, he had pneumonia. Um, he was sick for a while, but he didn't realize how bad it was until, um, he got admitted to the hospital. So, um, yeah, he passed away. I was, um, really grateful for, uh, time we had together. We were able to reconnect for 10 years, I think. Um, and, uh, yeah, we really had a great relationship, but it's because of him that I have this new relationship with my uncle and my cousin. And, um, I'll be forever grateful for that. And, um, you know, I miss, I mean, I miss him terribly, but, uh, he, um, gave me that gift of, um, another relationship. So, cause you know, he, they weren't Jehovah's witnesses. So we kind of didn't, I mean, when they were young, little, little, and his kids were little and we were little, we would, uh, go to like family picnics and stuff. And, um, then after that, we just never, we were never able to see him or, so it was nice to reconnect with them and, um, got a really good relationship with both of them. Um, I'm glad there's something to have gratitude for out of that situation. You know, the yeah. relationship like, you got to have with the, the, the uncle who passed. And then also, uh, you know, you've got something on the other side as well. You know, there's a continuation of some relationships that he yeah. introduced you to. And I mean, I think. Um, yeah. And he's my mom's other brother. So he's just yeah. like her too, in a way. Yeah. So, kind of. I love having that. Uh, yeah. I'm sure that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So um, where does that leave you? To, does that kind of bring you up to today? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, let's see. My kids, um, I just want to talk about my kids a little bit before um, anything. Uh, my oldest son, he, you know, I'd have him every weekend up until he was about 12 or 13. Um, his mom wouldn't enforce him coming over to, for visitation. So, um he would, he would come around less and less and, you know, he'd only call me if he needed a ride or if he needed money or something, stuff like that. He'd come over when my other son was there, but he'd never stay long. Um, I'm pretty sure, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm pretty sure his mother um, filled his head with lies uh, about me, making him not want to come around as often or whatever. Um, but the next few time, next, uh, last few years, um, he's been with his girlfriend and been with her for five or six years, I think. Um, I would make plans with him and he'd blow me off and leave me hanging, tell, telling me, yeah, we can do that and then never show up. And, um, you know, he, he didn't ignore me and just, um, 
not come around, but I didn't want to give up. I'd give up for a while and say, okay, whatever. He'll call me when he wants to, but um, I'd give him chances. Like, okay, he's not going to just keep doing this. Eventually he'll break out from his mother's uh, grasp, but um, he's 23 now. Um, I was hoping, you know, once he got out of his mom's house, he would uh, come around more often. Um, last time I talked to him, I invited him over um, January, last January, uh, 2020. Um, and he actually showed up, him and his girlfriend. So I invited him over for pizza and wings. Um, so he surprised the hell out of me. He showed up. I was like, you know, this is going to be the turning point um, for us to have a relationship because I don't really know him as an adult, you know? Um, I didn't. I thought, I thought that would be the changing point. Um, so after we left that, um, he, uh, we, um, we would invite him to, uh, you know, things, my daughter's plays at school or whatever. And then he, he would just never answer. Um, so, uh, I thought, okay, I'm just going to stop um, trying. So um, last October, I was scrolling through Facebook, and um, I found out that him and his girlfriend moved to Florida. Um, just never even told me or anything. Uh, that, that really, um, that was a gut punch. Really hurt. Um, I was like, what the hell? You know, what the hell did I ever do? Um, he was my pride and joy for the longest time. You know, he could have at least had the decency to come say goodbye to me. Um, but, you know, maybe there's still a glimmer of hope in my head that he's going to come around someday. Um, but I don't know. I just try not to yeah, think no, about it. That's one of those things you, you can't necessarily affect. It's going to be on mm -hmm. him, you know? Exactly. That's what I said. I, I did my, my part for 20 years. Now it's on you. Yeah. So if you want to be a part of my life, great. If not, then I'm not going to, um, you know, worry my head off or wonder what's, why, what did I do wrong? You know, I'm just going to. Well, you know, that's the thing in these relationships, you know, you, you, you worry about what did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. um, but oftentimes people's reactions to you, are more about themselves than they really are about you, you know? Right. Um, yeah. Like earlier, you were talking about uh, your sister and how, how you were kicked out of the apartment or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do we even know it was your sister who kicked you out and not her boyfriend? Maybe, right. and maybe she's just embarrassed because her boyfriend kicked you out and now she doesn't know how to address this or, you know, because right. every, again, everybody in your family seems to be dealing with their own traumas. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. But I don't know how many people are getting help and getting healthy, you know, and, and right. healthy people that are going to break those chains, break those cycles and, and have those relationships. Um, but we all get healthy when we're ready. Yeah. And there's only, you can only hope. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah. Hope for the best. And yeah. That's it. Um, I'm sorry that this cycle of trauma and pain and everything has affected your family so deeply for all these years. But that's, yeah. that's how, you know, the patterns, it's almost like you're given a, a role in a play. Uh, mm -hmm. And people tend to continue playing that role out in all of the relationships uh, and in their daily lives. And it's not until you get help that you can change that role and then start to act in different ways and get different results, you know. But it – yeah. Um, but you, you can't always control what other people do either, you know, in these relationships, if they're not healthy, you know, it's just going to take time. Yeah. That's all you can hope for. Just... Yeah. So what about your other kids? Um, my younger son, uh, he's turning 22 uh, in a couple of days. Um, he joined the army in January of uh, 2019. Um, he ended up, he did 10 weeks of boot camp in uh, Branson, Missouri just outside of Branson, Missouri. So um, we went to that, went to that graduation. Um, then he, uh, he wanted to be a Black Hawk helicopter mechanic. So um, halfway through that course, he decided that wasn't for him. So uh, he switched to warehouse uh, supply 
and he went to Virginia from April to October. Um, after that, he was able to come home for 10 days. Um, he surprised his sisters at school. Um, the teachers are all in on it. They got videos on it. It was pretty sweet. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it all, that worked out really good. So, um, yeah, he came home for 10 days. Then uh, we all went out to um, dinner before he had to leave again. Um, me and all the kids. My older son was there, too, and his girlfriend, my wife, and uh, the rest of the kids. Um, and after that, he uh, he left for uh, Fort, Fort uh, Wainwright, which is up in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. Oh, wow. So, yeah, he was up there for... Uh, about a, a little over a year he was up there um it was that was quite an experience for him um it was hard to keep in contact with uh during that time because uh the four hour time difference but um we managed here and there a few times um then just this past thanksgiving he surprised us all by just showing up at home <laughs> he said no uh, that time he was home for good um he he was having back issues, so he's um, right now he's going through the VA um, to try to get going with that. Um, he was under honorary discharge, is what they call it. It's between honorable and dishonorable. So if he goes through the VA and everything, then he'll get the honorable uh, discharge um, status. So, but he's home for good now. Um, um, I think he just got a job at a Walmart distribution center. So um, he's doing good. He's um, he, me and him are pretty close, like good. close, close um, yeah. So at least I have that. Um, so yeah, he's he's doing good. My two daughters, um, my older daughter, she'll be sixteen in October. Um, we start in eleventh grade. Um, her mom put her in a uh, very intense and competitive gymnastic class a few years ago. Uh, so she was she was doing that five days a week, um, right after school, like from five o'clock to eight thirty at night, and then a couple hours on Sunday morning. Um, and so she barely had time for anything else. Um, my uh, visitations took a hit to uh, every other weekend and for some reason she couldn't spend the night anymore. Um, so she can, she comes over like one day a weekend now for like eight hours. Um, she's working at her mom's restaurant um, as a um, hostess, I think. She's doing something there. So she's, I, I don't see her often, but um, when I do, no, we, we um, it's never enough time, but um, I'll take whatever time I can get. Sure. Um, so, and hopefully again, you know, that'll, that'll change once she gets her own vehicle and um, stuff like that. She'll be able to have more freedom. I can only hope, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, and my wife's daughter, she's uh, 14. Um, she just got a job a couple of weeks ago, um, summer job working at a restaurant as a bus girl. Hmm. Um, she really likes that. Um, she just started a couple of weeks ago. Um, that's good for her. That helps uh, my wallet a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, anyway, and um, for my birthday in uh, 2016, uh, my wife, uh, presented me with adoption papers and said she wanted me to adopt Marissa, her daughter. Um, I'm the only dad she's ever known. Um, so I did so. She was nine years old and I adopted her. Um, she's been a, a really, she's been a joy. She's been a pain in the ass. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's a joy. And she gave me a chance to be a full-time dad for these last 14 years and um, being her father, it hasn't been easy. I'll tell you that much, but um, you know, she has ADHD uh, among other things. What, what kid doesn't, you know, but um, 
she's uh, um, she's challenging. Um, she's a teenager, um, but I'm up for that challenge, uh, you know, and um, I'm just going to be the best dad I can be. Yeah, I'm sure it feels really good to have. I don't know. Look, I'm sat here and listened to all of this. <laughs> a lot to take in, I know. <laughs> I, and um, to me, you know, you're a sweet guy who's always wanted to have people around that cares about him that he can care about. And mm -hmm. so I'm sure it means a lot for you to have Marissa around, to have your wife around. Yeah. Um, to have, you know, you, you're looking for your people, your tribe to some degree that, yeah. you know, and to find that. And um, I'm just glad that you, you're finding that, uh, you know. Um, yeah, it took me a long time, but. Um, <laughs> I think you found bits and pieces of that along the way too, yeah. with your uncle and different people and Mark. Yeah, along the way, everything and, happened and I, for us. And, yeah, and um, was it Louie? Yep, Louis and, uh, and Louis's family, and you know, I think that along the way, there have been these—I uh, don't know—saving graces. I don't know. I'm looking for a word, but just these people that uh, that have come into your life that have been that for you, and uh, that have showed you that they cared, and that you get to care about as well. You know, I think that that's what we're all looking for is, you know, I think in the end it boils down to human connection. Uh, that's what we're going to remember on our deathbed is the people that have influenced our lives or the people that we've been able to have influence on as well. People that it's, it's the people that matter. Right. And I think that you're, you've been able to find a, a lot of that in amongst a lot of tragedy. Uh, you've also been able to find those, you know, beacons of light in the darkness, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love yeah, that sure. you have that. I love that you have that. Yeah, me too, man. Um, yeah, the, uh, there's a, about seven or eight men that I call, um, that have called my brothers um, that I like to give a shout out to. Yeah, shout them out. Um, Rob, Fred, Brian, Daryl, Eric, Louie, and Mike. Along with Mark, those are my brothers. And guys they never they never judged me they accepted me for who i was and i'll be forever grateful for that and um I'd like to be you know we've been in touch on facebook and stuff and i'd like to you know be part of their lives and uh, again and um you know hopefully we'll be able to um get together sometime and hang out and i just want them to know how much i really appreciate what they've done for me in my life without knowing probably but you know, they really made a big impact in my life and I'll be forever grateful for that. I think, I think after this, they're going to know a lot more about your life too. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll, uh, they'll still be there. They won't, um, change. They won't change the way they feel about me. I'm sure. Oh no, no. They knew the worst of me. I was a Jehovah's witness and they still didn't, you know, <laughs> they still wanted to be my friend. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, they're the weird people. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, let me ask you. So what do you love about your life today? And is there anything that, you know, other than spending more time with your brothers there, uh, is there anything that you're hoping for? Um, well, I love that my, uh, I love my life right now. My wife is awesome. She's um, very supportive of me. <laughs> Um, and right now, uh, through her job, she works for, uh, um, County DSS, uh, Saratoga County DSS, um, her job the union offered us uh, free tuition to college. So, um, we're both going to college right now. She's, um, going for social work and I'm going for accounting. Um, that is awesome. Good for you yeah. guys. So we jumped on that real quick and um, oh leg up. You know, everybody needs a chance. That's that's awesome. Yeah, and um, we have we also had the option to transfer after two years to um, the university to pursue a bachelor's degree. So um, hoping in the next few years, I'm going to be changing my um, my career path. 
one way or another. So I've always been good at um, counting numbers and stuff like that. Um, so I've been doing that since last October. We both have. So we're, uh, we're finishing almost uh, finishing up on our first year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been great. Um, took a few to get used to being back at school again. Um, it's all online, but still, you know, it's different. Um, it's been, you know, a long time since I've been out of school, but yeah, it's been going really good. And, um, that's what I'm pursuing. Um, so between college and work and everything else going on, we're pretty busy and, um, but once this is done, it's going to pay off, I'm pretty sure. And um, we're going to be able to do the things we want to do when we retire. <laughs> we just want to travel and uh, I think we're just going to buy an RV and just travel the world. <laughs> <laughs> One way or another. Well, I don't know. I, I hate to break this to you, Drew, but I don't know if you're going to travel the world in an RV. <laughs> well, but maybe by then they'll build a bridge that we can drive across. Maybe the uh, North America. How's that? How about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, man, that's oh, awesome. So that, I love that. I love yeah, that. We're, um, we're planning for our 15th wedding event anniversary. We want to go to Ireland. Ooh. That's where, uh, pretty sure that's where my, some of my ancestors are from. Um, you know, Shannon, the big um, Irish last name. <laughs> so we just want to go over there and just check it out. And I want to set, put my feet in the Shannon River. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I think that, so, that's exciting. So how long? So I think you said you've been together. For 12 years. We've been together 14, married 12. Okay. So then the next couple of years will be, uh, be in some greener pastures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is the green a, a, a reference to Ireland, Irish, and all that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> all the pictures I've seen, the grass is so much greener over there. Yeah, it is a beautiful it's, country, at least from the yeah. pictures I've seen as well. I've never yeah, been. I mean, they could be uh, enhanced, but it looks beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's fantastic, Drew. I'm glad that you've got you know some good things in your life. You certainly deserve it, and you've got some good people around you, and some good things to look forward to. That's exciting. Um, yeah. And I hope you can also appreciate how incredibly strong you've been. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I've come to realize that, um, I, you know, yeah. I've, I've, I've always had to be strong, Superman strong. Yeah. So. I was say, you got the S <laughs> on your chest. My yeah. Friend. Super strong, not just regular strong. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Everything I've been through and, you know, put up with, uh, it's made me the person I am today. Yeah. And we'll go from there and see what happens. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you sharing your story, Drew. Uh, yeah, man, I appreciate this uh, platform. Um, I, I appreciate everything you do, man. Uh, thank you for letting me get my story out there. And uh, it's awesome, man. Every, whatever you're doing, it's awesome. <laughs> everything you do is great. All right. Well, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you very much. Yeah, man, no problem.